Second item of business on the agenda tonight is the election of chair and vice chair for the committee. Uh, do I have any nominations for chair? Councillor Pierce? Councillor Bell. Councillor Bell, do you accept? Do I have any other nominations? Councillor Coleman? Uh, seconder? Councillor Miller, all those in favor? Councillor Bell is the chair. Uh, do I have nominations for vice chair of the committee? Councillor Pierce? Councillor Miller. Councillor Miller, do you accept? Uh, y yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do I have any other nominations? Councillor Chambers? Uh, seconder for that motion, Councillor Coleman. All those in favor? Councillor Bell, you may assume the chair. Thank you. Mr. Adam is a very efficient election, and uh, it's a pity that John Wheat is not here because I would like to recognise his uh, leadership in this uh, committee over the last uh, year in my time, and I think even before my time, he was in the chair. So when he comes to the next meeting, we will uh, make sure we don't forget to, uh, to say that to him. So if I can move on, um, would somebody uh, like to? Make a motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Councillor Faraday, seconded by uh, Councillor Coleman. Anybody would like to add anything to the agenda? Seeing nothing, then I will seek uh, that we vote on it. All in favour? Thank you. Agenda approved. Uh, if anybody has a, a pecuniary interest, they could declare it now. Failing that, if we recognize one as we go through the agenda, please bring it to uh, our attention. We have uh, no delegations, no petitions, no presentations. So I'll move on to item six, which is the adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, we are looking at the minutes of February the 4th. Would anybody like to move that? Mayor Bailey will move. Uh, Councillor Howells will uh, second. Anybody have any comments on or corrections to the agenda, uh, to the uh, minutes? Seeing none, then we'll vote on that. All in favour? Those opposed? Motion carried. Item 7, uh, business is arising from the minutes. Anybody have any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, we'll, we'll press on. So we move on to item 8, which uh, is public hearings under the Planning Act to receive information from the public. And the first item, A, uh, regards uh, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 0120, uh, Case Vandenberg 310, East River Road. I'm not sure who's presenting. Come on, yeah. Thank you. Amendment for 310 East Harris Road for the purpose of removing a site specific provision on the lands to oh, thank you <laughs> on the lands to undergo a subsequent severance application or merger. This presentation is to be received for information purposes only. The subject lands are located on the east side of the East River Road, north of Scenic Drive and East River Road intersection. The subject lands currently have an area of approximately 3.69 hectares or nine acres and are currently occupied by a single detached dwelling and accessory structure. Within the County of Brand official plan, the subject lands have been designated as rural residential with small portions identified as woodland and vegetation and natural heritage. 
The official plan does contemplate the severances and lot line adjustments on lands designated as rural residential. The subject lands are currently zoned as rural residential with site specific provision RR45. They underwent a rezoning application in 2016. This provision permits a large accessory structure for the purpose of storing a maximum of four commercial and four construction vehicles on the subject lands. The application is proposing to sever and merge an area of approximately 1.68 hectares with the parcel to the south. After the land merger, the south lot will have an area of approximately 13 acres, whereas the retained lot will have an area of 4.7 acres and will retain the existing dwelling. It is staff's understanding an older accessory structure will be removed to facilitate the merger. The rezoning application is needed for the lands to be merged in order to remove the site-specific provision. They will prevent the merged lands from having the ability to build a large accessory structure through this site-specific provision. No new residential building lots will be created. The house and associated structures are to be severed and the retained lands being merged to the parcel immediately to the south. The official plan has policies that speak to development and severances on lands designated as rural residential and expects lands to be compatible and consistent with surrounding lots. Staff note the retained lot continues to meet the development standards of the zoning bylaw. In regards to next step, preparation of staff recommendation will be prepared. Review of an internal and external comments received through circulation. Should the rezoning be, be approved at a future date, a subsequent severance application will be undertaken by the applicant. This application will have its own circulation and commenting period. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee should have. Thank you. Member of the committee would like to ask questions of a member? Seeing none, thank you, member. I'm sure we might have to call on you later. Okay. Uh, would the uh, applicant or the agent of the applicant, uh, agent of the applicant, like to uh, make a presentation? When you come up, if you could let us know your name and address for the record. My name is uh, Case Vandenberg and we own uh, 310 East River Road. If you can see from the uh, original parcel there, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of history all. So anyways, to the chair and members of the Planning Advisory Committee, first of all, allow me to thank you for addressing my application. First of all, give me a little bit of history on the, on the property. Uh, as Amanda said, in 2016, we made an application to change the zoning of the subject lands to uh, a state residential to permit residential uses along this application was the, was the storage of commercial and construction vehicles, equipment, and oversized garage to facilitate the cre uh, creation of one residential lot. We modeled this under the same application that the County of Brant Planning Advisory Committee, along with the County Brant County Mayor and the Councilors, have passed in 215 for McVay Road, 405 McVay Road. In this application, the same type and number of commercial vehicles and equipment were applied for and passed. With the County of Brant staff approval, the Planning Advisory Committee went once again in 2016 where they passed the application allowing the lands to be rezoned to residential use and to permit the oversized garage. <clears throat> in, on um, 2000, September 2016, the Committee of Justice met and approved the severance of the 146 meters frontage to my son, which is to the south of the existing home. And in 2017, through the Committee of Adjustments, they created two more lands, two more lots on the south part. So <clears throat> with this application before you, we we're trying, applying to remove the site-specific provision to be moved on a portion of the lands, roughly 63 meters of frontage and a depth of 224 meters. And this would leave a balance of the site-specific provision of roughly 83 meters of frontage with the 205 meters. The 63 meters will be added onto the property to the right to a family member and in the future he may apply to create a future lot. So anyone just click that item? So there's the what we propose to do, okay? So then the, uh, the, the zoning, ER zoning per category permits residential dwellings to be located in lots having a minimum area of 0.6 hectares and minimum frontage of 40 meters. The retained portion with the old farm house exceeds that minimum applications. We, through the previous applications, completed MDS study, study for water wells, which 
be available to Idaho water supply for any future lots. As you note from the pictures, the existing shed. Yeah, go ahead. There's a, will be removed. Oh, no, keep going, I'm sorry. Yeah, right there. That one will be removed because, as you know from the pictures, the existing small shed will have to be removed to facilitate the severance and the subsequent merger as a shed will not fall in the required sideline requirements in the county of Brant. Okay, so keep going. I saw that one. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, to the north of the existing home is where the proposed shed is. So just to the next one. The next one. And then, yeah, right there. So, no, next one. There's a little black, yeah, okay. So anyways, just click back one, sorry. I thought there was one, yeah. So where it is is to the, uh, oh, I didn't show on there that picture. But anyways, what we're trying to do is keep it to the north of the old house. And then what we're trying to do is make the footprint a lot smaller. And you can see what it looks like. It'll be, go to the next one, Adam. What the shed will be is like a two-story with the doors on the bottom, core slab, and then doors on the front. So the footprint of the shed will be a whole lot smaller than originally was uh, was uh, applied for. And I think that's about all I have to say. The top part will be built just to allow access to park lawnmowers and recreation uh, items which are for our family use. The uh, commercial vehicles and so on are just normal vans and normal trailers. My pickup truck is a commercial vehicle because that has a yellow sticker on there and that's the same as my, my normal vans are the same thing. Already? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We just told yeah. you there. Uh, would any member of the committee like to ask a question of the case? Hearing none, if you just uh, stay in the audience and we may be asking you about things later. Okay, thank you. Um, we now come to the uh, public section. So if any member of the public would like to comment on this application, would they please come forward? Is somebody coming forward? As you come forward, if you could let us know your uh, name and address for the record, thank you. I'm Jane Southgate, and I live right across the road on 301 East River Road. We have the horse farm there. What are, my concern is, is I can't figure out what they're doing on the map here. Are you taking it now from two small lots and one big lot? It looks like to me it's five lots. Is that what is happening? No, excuse me. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to answer that question. We'll, we'll note that question. Okay. I'll give you an answer before we, uh, before we move, move this sec section on. Thank you. Okay, so I'm done. It, it, that's all your... That was my question. Thank I just can't figure out what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Would any other member of the public like to comment on this application? I'll ask for a second time. And for a third time, seeing none, I'll close that particular section. But I think it's important to... Uh, have an answer to that question. So, Kate, if you want to come back and answer that question. I'm, I'm trying to understand which part did you mean, like the, the existing part, or what have you got on the here? Yeah. Yeah. Question clear, okay? Yeah. So right now there's there's the, the three lots that my son has gotten, okay? And then later on, that little piece that we're severing off, the 63 meters, that's going to join to his piece there. So then he may later on get a, a do another lot in there. At this point, it's just getting added to his property. Could we see the, could we see the drawing again, uh, Adam? Just to, so everybody can see that. Yeah, it's this one here, Adam. I don't know. It's the one that you got sent around. No, no, from the town. Yeah, right there. Sorry, sorry. Go back. Right there. Yeah. So if we could explain that for the benefit of everybody, now that we can see the uh, drawing. Yeah. So there's the three lots in there that my son has. Okay. And that was all from one. There's the one three lines there. And then the blue part is going to get added 
to the fifth part, which is the remaining large question mark, and then the CCS Committee of Qualified Law. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I hope that's clear to everybody. Um, at this point, I will ask the uh, committee if they would like to decide on this. Uh, Bailey? Yes, uh, Yep. Seconded by uh, Councillor Howes. Um, any comments on that motion before we vote? Seeing none, could I take a uh, vote then? Those in favour? Those against? Thank you. Okay, we move on to uh, section nine, which are public hearings under the Planning Act to consider staff recommendations. And for the benefit of those people in the audience, uh, what we get at this stage of the process is what you've just seen, but then reviewed by staff, and staff come back with a recommendation. So what we just heard now uh, regarding Pace van der Berg's um, proposal, staff will take that, they'll bring forward the recommendation that this committee will hear at some time in the future. So we're now at that stage of the process. The first application is uh, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 3719 regarding 3 West Harris Road, and the applicants are Lou and Irma Osterhoff. Um, so if Amanda would like to take us through the story, thank you. Thank you. Through the Chair, staff are recommending refusal of the proposed Zoning Bylaw Amendment for 3 West Harris Road for the purposes of reducing required MDS distances from 514 meters to 248. The subject lands are located on the east side of West Harris Road, north of the Brant School Road and West Harris Road intersection. Within the County of Brant official plan, the subject lands have been designated as rural residential, natural heritage, and a portion identified as woodland and vegetation. The subject lands are zoned as rural residential and natural heritage. To facilitate the proposed severance applications, the applicant sought to amend section 4.24 of the zoning bylaw requiring applications to meet MBS. Staff note the proposed lot meets the required lot area and frontage for the land zoned as rural residential. Staff also acknowledge the applicant, applicant has submitted a planning justification letter, rezoning and severance sketch, archeological assessment, which was accepted by the province, and an environmental impact study. Staff also note the application was presented to the Agricultural Advisory Committee, which supported the proposal. Based on staff's understanding of the proposal, which was the sorry, based on staff's understanding, the proposal was supported because if the Harris Farm were to expand, the existing houses at nine West Harris and sixteen West Harris Harris would have a greater impact than the two proposed lots. However, this resolution does not speak to the reduction of MBS, and if they would support a reduction of fifty two percent, they only it only speaks to the future expansion of the Harris Farm. Staff are not supportive of the proposal as a reduction from 514 meters to 248 meters equates to a 52% reduction. Staff have received direction from OMAFRA to use a type A calculation for lands designated as agricultural and a type B calculation for residential designations. Since the subject lands are designated as rural residential, a type B calculation is to be used. Staff acknowledge previous applications used a type A calculation, but direction has been provided provided to staff from OMAFRA to use a type B calculation in these scenarios. Furthermore, it is staff's understanding these lots were developed during the previous official plan and previous zoning bylaw. While the farms to the east and the south of the subject lands have reduced MBS requirements through guideline 12, reducing the Harris Farms MBS from 514 meters to 248 meters through guideline 43 does not meet the intent of this policy. Guideline 43 specifically states MD1, MDS 1 setback should not have should not be reduced except in limited site-specific circumstances that meet the intent of the MDS document. Examples include circumstances that mitigate environmental or public health and safety impacts or avoid natural or human-made hazards. For example, moving a barn to accommodate a stream. Staff, will, staff also note the MDS guidelines specifically state, generally, OMAFRA does not support or encourage reductions to MDS setbacks. Staff also note OMAFRA has reviewed the MBS section of the re recommendation report and are comfortable with staff's methodology with minimal comments received. Staff reviewed the County of Brand official plan and zoning bylaw and each of these documents specifically state development or proposed uses are to comply with the minimum distance separation formula. While the MBS guidelines contemplates for reduced setbacks through guideline 12, 42, and 43, 
it is staff's opinion a reduction of 52% would not be maintaining the intent of the MBS guidelines. It is also staff's opinion a 52% reduction would not be maintaining the intent of the MDS policies within the County of Brand Official Plan or Zoning Bylaw. While staff acknowledge the proposed severed lots meet the development standards for land zoned as rural residential, it is staff's opinion the proposed reduction of MDS from 514 meters to 248 is not supportable and should be refused as it is not maintaining the intent of the MDS guidelines, the County of Brand Official Plan, or the County of Brand Zoning Bylaw. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee should have. Thank you, Brenda. Committee questions for Amanda? No questions for Amanda? I think uh, we'll be following your light there. Thank you, Amanda. Would the applicant or the agent of the applicant like to come forward and present the case? If you could offer us your name and address as you come by. Sorry, Mr. Chair, point of order. I don't think that mic is on. Thank you. Um, the, uh, with me this evening is uh, Mr. Howard Snodgrass, uh, planning consultant, who will be making the main body of the presentation. Uh, there were environmental issues raised and reported on throughout the uh, staff report as well. And uh, as noted, there was an environmental impact study uh, submitted um, by North South Environmental um, sometime mid last year or in the fall. And uh, re there were recent comments on that. As a result of those comments, we had the author, Sarah Mingi, uh, from, from North South um, prepare uh, a presentation. But because of the direction we hope you will take this evening, we're not going to have her make a full presentation uh, in response. She has indeed responded. You have uh, her response before you. Um, we also have an arborist here um, to deal with the uh, various matters in support of the uh, environmental uh, issue with respect to the trees. Again, we will, you have his report. We will not be asking him to speak. Uh, both of them are here to answer uh, your questions. Uh, lastly, um, Mr. Oosterhoff has also circulated uh, his presentation and uh, he would like to be able to say a few words. So I, I just want to remind uh, the committee that this is an application for a rezoning as has been outlined. There are related applications that have been submitted but are awaiting the outcome here and that is two applications for severance. It is my submission to you that matters such as the environmental matters, uh, archeological, uh, GRCA, um, uh, should be addressed by the committee. And your task tonight is to deal with the application for a, an amendment to the zoning bylaw. It's not a minor variance, it's an application for an amendment to a zoning bylaw and that is, should solely be the issue of the other matters dealt with at the committee uh, of adjustment level. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'd ask Mr. Snodgrass to uh, present uh, the planning position on the, largely on the MDS issue, but he will touch on the environmental. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman, committee members, the um, overhead on the screen shows three farm locations. The subject property is shown here, a horse farm to the south and another farm to the east and then a farm that's known as the Harris Farm up here. This farm to the east 
and this farm to the south are both not in the play tonight for the MDS because under the implementation guidelines, the MDS is adjusted and the separation distance between this barn and the location of the two dwellings and this barn and the location of the two dwellings is adjusted. So I'm just trying to highlight that. Next page, please. This is an, an extract of the county official plan which shows the subject lands with the rural residential designation and the environmental is on the rear portion. It is not on the front portion where the houses are to be built. The bottom part of this slide shows the intent of the county official plan and pardon me but I'm getting to that age where I have to use glasses. The primary intent of the rural residential designation is to recognize existing concentrations of large lot residential development. And the bottom highlighted thing identifies single residential dwellings are permitted. Next page. This is the rural residential zoning. Next page. This particular overhead shows three distinctive land uses. The first is the blocks that are identified in red, which are existing residential development. And here are the two residences that were referred to by Amanda, with the Harris Farm being adjacent here. Along this part of Grant School Road, are several existing residential <coughs> lots that are not yet built upon. And then this is the location of the two proposed building lots. Next page. This is the overhead shows the effect of the MDS calculation. And the thing I'd like to highlight with this overhead is until a year and a half ago, the separation distance would be the smaller circle. And if you take note here, the smaller circle for the MDS calculation would have almost allowed the creation of the two lots. So what I'm indicating is the change from factor A to factor B has meant that it's been necessary to apply for this rezoning. I would also highlight that under the factor B, those existing building lots along here, Grant School Road, are likely going to have to apply for an MDS variance. Next slide. This is just the um, explanation of how the MDS was adjusted from the calculation where it went down from 532 is the actual distance and the MDS adjusted downward is 521. Next slide. And with this one, the MDS adjusted variance is 153 meters and the actual separation is 241. Next slide. This shows the actual separation distance between the two proposed lots and the Harris Barn, and it's the reason why we're applying for the MD, MDS variance. Next slide. Amanda is correct when she says that, in general, MDS should be varied, but the MDS manual clearly sets out a mechanism that you're to follow if a variance is to be considered. And without going through anything on this page, next page please. 
there's four sections and these are highlighted in the bold things, titles, and then the factors underneath are highlighted as well. And this proposal complies with three of four sections for why it is appropriate to consider a variance here. Next page. And this is the part of our presentation. So just quickly going over these points. In general, we agree that MDS should only be varied in limited circumstances. We feel that the, ver the circumstances in this application qualify. There's been other developments, as you saw in the one slide, that have been approved and accommodated and are actually closer to some of the existing and historical livestock operations. These two lots do not involve the removal of any agriculturally used land. The Harris Farm MDS to the north should be varied from Rule 43 because, as was indicated in the previous slide, in some cases, a surrounding land use and environmental or practicality issue may warrant a reduced MDS set. And it's my opinion that the setback can be qualified for eight reasons as set out on this page. From the surrounding land use standpoint, the two proposed lots are similar. From an environmental perspective, the existing intervening bushland between the two proposed lots and the Harris Farm form a natural buffer against odors and noise. From a practicality standpoint, the two proposed lots might have received approvals at an earlier date from less restrictive versions of the MDS formula. The two proposed lots are not removing any agricultural land. The site is already designated and zoned for the use. Two existing residences constrain the Harris Barn and are closer. If desired, the proponent is agreeable to placing a restrictive covenant on title of the two proposed lots to reduce the possibility of any nuisance complaints. And the plans for the Harris Barn are still somewhat uncertain. They still have the right to reestablish whatever livestock use they had an earlier date. And indications are they may want a 12 alpacas. And my calculations have shown they could accommodate 400 alpacas. The Harris Barns can continue to be used for livestock purposes, for the uses for which they have legal non-conforming status to do so, irrespective of the approvals or the refusal of the two proposed lots. If the two additional residences existed between the two lot proposal and the Harris Barn, then pursuant to Rule 43, this bylaw amendment would not be necessary. Long and short, we're here because there are not two residences. The AAC has already advised they have no problems with the requested amendment. Next page, please. This is just an extract of the PPS, and even the bottom point here is highlighted. The staff acknowledged that the PPS does common contemplate for limited residential development on rural lands. Next page. This is the environmental report that was submitted last year. Next page. The highlighted section reads, this plan severance and development of single family homes is in compliance with the PPS, the growth plan, the county of Brant, and GRC policy. Next page. Some of the conclusions are highlighted here. No globally or provincially significant species or plant commodities were found. Next point here is there are no long-term negative impacts to the function of the woodland or slopes that result from this development. 
Next page. Following the last meeting, uh, there was a report prepared by county planning staff which indicated they had concerns. So we asked our environmentalists to vote again, and that extract is here, and that is part of the addendum that's in front of you tonight. In the absence of mapped heritage systems on the property, Brant County policies regarding woodlands and vegetations provide some latitude for the development within key heritage areas. If it can be demonstrated through an EIS that it would have no effect on the feature or functions for which the area is identified. An EIS was requested and Sarah, the author of the report, continues to support the conclusions provided in the EIS that there's no significance of the plantation on the property. I'm sorry, that the significance of the plantation on the property is related to linkage functions as it provides linkage along and between two portions of Fairchild's Creek. And then the bottom comment, as I concluded in my report, it is my opinion that the proposed development would meet the test of no negative impact as long as the outdoor amenities, driveways, septic bed, limit tree removal, and other disturbances. Next page. Also in your addendum tonight is the report of the arborist. And one thing that is highlighted is LCR, which stands for low crown ratio. And in the middle of the highlighted paragraph, it reads, when the ratio of the length, length of the live foliage to the tree height is expressed as a percentage, the lower the LCR, the weaker the tree. Then it gives an example. If you have a tree that's 40 feet high, then 10% of it is where the crown is and it's much better and more acceptable if the ratio is 60%. So again here, a low LCR means minimal woodlot value. Next page, please. This is the comments of the GRCA, no objections. Next page. This is the page from the ministry dealing with the archaeological acceptance and the ministry satisfied. That's the extent of my general comments. As Jay indicated in the opening remarks, we're pointing out that the MDS formula does contemplate a variance. To say that it doesn't is an outright misrepresentation. MDS can be varied. We followed the manual. We've highlighted how you go through it with the manual. And for the reasons we've indicated, we're asking for the committee's support for X number of reasons that I've already highlighted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Do I understand Mr. Osho has something to say? Tonight? Yes. Could you take his input first and then take questions? Okay. Lou. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Louis Osterhoff from 3 West Harris Road in Brant County. I'm the proponent of, of the development application before this committee tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening, and I will keep my comments brief. I, I hope the committee will be able to find in favor of my proposal. The opposing, the opposing rate payers have brought forth objections to our proposal. They have actively lobbied and pressured the county, resulting in a negative recommendation from the planning department for my proposal. I hope to demonstrate that their efforts and conclusions do not hold up to the facts. Any not-in-my-backyard objections do not constitute facts. 
The lengthy 150-plus page report from planning regurgitates all the arguments, but at the end of the day, there are, it seems, basically two main points of discussion on this application and development proposal. One, the interpretation of the MDS formula, which we have heard um, Mr. Snodgrass speak about again this evening. And number two, the environmental impact of development, which I understand has its proper form at the Committee of Adjustment. The rate players and planning department have taken some license with the facts, I think. At the ag meeting, the rate payer, our good neighbor, made it sound as if our proposal had previously failed when in fact it was a proposal of their own property in 2003 that failed. It was proven on record that our proposal had never been attempted. This misleading information, and this is important, it could make a large impact on any committee considering the application, including this one. In their references to Amafra, Brant Planning highlights that Amafra does not encourage MDS variances. We heard that also from Howard a moment ago. However, Planning neglects to mention that Omafra stated that there is a latitude for reasonable cases. Furthermore, Omafra reminded Planning that the MDS guideline is to be used with discretion. It is not a hard and fast rule, nor is Omafra the MDS police. Finally, Omafra stated that the point of reference and constraint for the Harris Farm, which is the one in contention, would be the closest home, not the development area, but the closest home at 16 West Harris Road. Thus, after pages and pages of MDS argument, interpretation, and graphs, it turns out our rezoning application is not only minor in nature, but it is not even applicable according to Amafra. My consultant, Mr. Ha uh, Mr. Snodgrass, has also ably demonstrated how the MDS formula can be interpreted to allow for a variance of a zoning change uh, on our proposal. As you will be aware, the proposal was referred to the Ag Committee who upon hearing the matter and receiving OMAFRA input had no difficulty with the proposed development. This decision of the Ag Committee is recorded in the minutes uh, of February 7th, 2020. Also, as recorded in the minutes, a representative of OMAFRA, Mr. Drew Krinklaw, was present at this meeting to give clarity on the history of MDS and how it may be applied. Mr. Krinklaw demonstrated that our proposed development would not further constrain farming in the area. He stated that the point of reference, as said before, for the Harris Farm would be the closest home at 16 West Harris Road. It is very important that the Agricultural Advisory Committee did not object to our proposed development. I feel it should guide the discussion on MDS. This committee, that, this committee here tonight, the PAC committee, um, Excuse me. Uh, this committee sought input from the Ag Committee. That was uh, uh, an interim um, event between the first meeting and the second. Uh, the Ag Committee sought clarity from OMAFRA, who gave advice and further clarity resulting in support of our proposal by the Ag Committee. One would wonder then, why is planning opposed? Furthermore, our proposal is in line with and lends itself well to the provincial polity for infill lots. This proposal does not impinge on any agricultural land whatsoever. We are not proposing to build in the middle of a one acre or 100 acre farm field. On the environmental point, our, our environmental consultant, North South Environmental, in their original report described the area as a significant woodland link. This applies most aptly to the natural area adjacent to Fairchild Creek, where it should be noted development would not take place. In the north-south environmental rebuttal to the Brant environmental planner's questions, this logic is reinforced. A copy of that report, as mentioned also by Howard, has been distributed. Um, North-South also demonstrates that the official plan mapping for Brant County does not include our property as heritage woodland except for the 30-meter corridor along Fairchild Creek. As can be seen in the attached photo, which is attached to the handout you have before you, the corridor along the creek was the only woodland in the area prior to the existence of the uh, white pine plantation. Councillors, I invite you to view my property in person on a site visit. 
If you are unsure of the information that you've been given, I would ask that you defer your decision until you have visited the site and seen the proposed lots in person. I'm sure you'll be able to determine for yourself that the plantation woodlot on our property is basically a few acres of dead and dying trees. The attached photos, again on your handout, does not allow, um, sorry. The attached photos uh, does not allow for healthy growth. I have obtained photos in this area from the related, uh, from the previous owner, Doug Drake, which show the pine bush as a soybean field in the 1990s. Doug related that his father planted the trees in the early 1990s as protection against county road encroachment. He did this on his own with no cooperation from government agencies. The Brant environmental planner argues that this woodlot is mapped as heritage woodland and that it was a reforestation product project. Clearly it was neither. Those are simply not the facts. The 30 uh, feet the 30 foot tall pine trees are in poor condition with only a few feet of crown showing any green. Below the canopy, there are only dead branches and no further growth or ground fauna is seen due to lack of sunlight. The trees are dying and in danger of falling and many have already. The majority of the white pine plantation, plantation trees need to be removed if, re if recovery of some remaining trees is to be achieved. This has been done and is being done with noticeable success by our neighbor at 9 West Harris, whose home is also situated in this same woodlot plantation, but they are opposed to us doing the same. We have commissioned a certified arborist from Daikan Lands Landscaping to assess the condition of the plantation woodlot. His report, attached to your handout again, reflects that what I have said about the poor condition of the trees and the need for remedial attention. This report also points out that the trees being attacked or are being attacked and destroyed on another front by an invasive pine bark beetle. Uh, and he's available here to speak to that if uh, necessary. Um, his report does agree that the natural deciduous forest along Fairchild Creek is fairly healthy and is not in need of remedial attention. I'd like to mention to the committee that we take pride in ownership and that we would ensure the area retains its unique environmental characteristics as much as possible. We're convinced that any environmental concerns can be and will be mitigated through careful review at the building permit stage. The Committee of Adjustment would certainly impose development criteria to ensure this. In summary, I ask the Planning Committee to consider the following and find in favor of the zoning amendment that we are requesting. Or if you feel that more information is needed, then to defer your decision to this evening. So, number one, the site is already designated and zoned rural residential. Two, the proposal meets all the requirements set out for residential uh, rural lots in Brant County, including lot size, setbacks, etc. Number three, the proposed lots are not removing any agricultural land from production. Number four, the provincial policy is to create infill lots and not break up agricultural farmland. This proposal seeks to do exactly that, create an infill lot. Number five, a surrounding, from a surrounding land use standpoint, the proposed lots are similar to other nearby residential uses. Number six, the archeological assessment report that we commission supports development. Seven, Ministry of Heritage, Sport and Tourism Culture reviewed the archeological report and supports development. The IES, that's number eight, IES report recommends development under mitigating conditions through careful review at the building permit stage. Number uh, nine, according to Amafra, MDS does not factor on our property. If they, they have stated that 16 West Harris is the reference point for MDS. And finally, the GRCA has provided written support for our development. Councillors, um, I appeal to you that if you vote tonight, you vote not just with your staff recommendation, but that you vote how you feel and how you see the situation. Thank you for your kind consideration. Thank you, Mr. Osho. I think it probably makes sense if the three presenters come back up to the front, and I would then invite the committee to ask questions of any one of the three of them. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> and I apologize because I've, I've seen this application a few times. But I just want clarification on this one question. Probably be best uh, maybe for Howard. The the big the big amendment that we're looking at is that reduction of MDS from 514 meters to 248. And uh, Adam, is it possible to get page 54 of our package up? It shows uh, the two big MDS circles. That's it, right there. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair to Howard. The yellow one is Harris, and that's going from 514 to 248. But right now, we know <laughs> that there's there's nothing in the barn, and there hasn't been for a while. Now, they, they will probably go with alpacas, as one of the letters said. The second one, the purple one, um, that also has to, um, that doesn't comply with MDS, correct? And, uh, and if I... If no, I, it does comply. It complies with the adjusted MDS. Okay. So if I go with that setback, it's 477 meters. So, like, if I'm looking at the purple line, or purple circle, it looks like it, it, it kind of cuts into those lots, but you're saying it does not? It, it cuts in, but the setback is adjusted downward because we have four residences here that allows for the separation distance between the barn and the outer line to be adjusted downward. Okay. So I, that there's I, only one MDS formula that we need a variance from, and that's the Harris barn. Okay. Let, let's pretend those four residences don't exist. Uh, how much would it... Would it exceed on the on that purple one? Would it would it be four seventy seven minus? Would it be eighty nine meters? I can't say for sure. I can't answer that question. Okay, because it looks like a four hundred seventy seven meter setback is required, and then it looks like it's three hundred eighty eight meters to the lot line. That's that's why I'm asking. But the houses really they wouldn't be. At the back, they I don't know where you're getting your 477 from. It doesn't show in any of my calcs. It's it's at the very bottom. It says 477 meters. No, <laughs> right there. That says 477. That's the circumference of that purple solid line. Okay. Then what we've done is we've done the actual separation distance, and what we found was the MDS adjusted is 521 meters for that for that yeah like i'm indicating i don't necessarily agree with that circle because this was prepared by some other firm okay, my I'm, understanding I'm, is I'm, that in, I'm indicating that the actual separation distance between here and the building sites is 532 the mds adjusted is 521 why this says 477, I cannot offer any comment at this point in time. Okay, maybe we can ask the plan afterwards too. Yeah, okay, because, all right, I'll, I'll leave it there. I just want some clarification on that, and I don't have it, so maybe we'll go to the plan. Uh, uh, Councilor, who's for you? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, to whoever from, uh, to Mr. Hoff wants to, to respond. Um, is the, the largest point, I have two questions, that's okay. Is the largest point here that, from, from your point of view, that even in the solid line, yellow and purple uh, MDS setbacks, that there are currently 10 residences that are within that? Is that, is that really the main thrust of, of the argument here? The main thrust is if there's four or more that are closer than our two building sites, then all we have to do is show the four, which is what we've done. And that's why the adjusted modification is reduced. 
And then my second question to you, Mr. Chair. Um, nothing in the, the documentation I saw from your group addressed the water issue that has come up again and again from other residences, saying that there's already issues with the water and lack of water and having to bring in water. I would Can suggest that that particular issue is something to be dealt with by the Committee of Adjustment because they impose a condition that says we have to meet water requirements of the County of Brant as a condition of approval. It's nothing that is normally dealt with by this committee. I was hoping to finish my question, but that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peters. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, a um, couple things here. So, first of all, when we come in tonight, we get these two set on our desks in front of us. Uh, Mr. Osterhoff, then you proceeded to pretty much read this, which tells me that you put some effort into it, which it appears you did, and I appreciate that. My point I'm trying to make here, this has been going on for quite some time. I'm sure I can speak for the rest of the councillors and the mayor here. We like to be prepared when we come to a meeting. I'm trying to understand why we didn't receive this before five minutes before the meeting. Sir, if I Excuse could respond. Excuse me, Howard. I, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. Just let me finish, please. And then to have it read to us, which is, I, I'm not quite sure why that happened. But at any rate, if I could get some sort of understanding, number one, why did we just receive this tonight and not in our packages prior to so we could properly prepare ourselves? In answer to that question, and on what Lou answered to, we received it a week ago Friday. And I emailed it to the county here a week ago yesterday, the environmental report. So it's been in the county's hands for a week. And then the arborist came in last Thursday, and it was automatically sent over to the county staff. I asked Amanda this morning if this had been distributed to the committee, and she said no, because staff had not had a chance to review it. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, from that, we knew we had to distribute it to you because staff had not done so. So that's the reason you have it tonight. We originally were, had asked for a deferral because we wanted a chance to meet with staff. And we were told the thing is scheduled for tonight. You need to come prepared. And if a deferral is in the cards, you can ask for it. So that's the rationale for why it has come forward. Because the environmental planner's report only came to light at the Special Agricultural Advisory Committee meeting. We were caught off guard with that. It had been authored 10 days before. So if you feel you've been blindsided tonight, we felt we were blindsided a month ago. So appreciate that statement, Howard. What I'm saying here is this is from Mr. Osterhoff and this is from the Arborist. So if you're telling me that the Arborist just came in this past Thursday, that's a little disappointing in the sense that how long have you been working on this and this is coming to us on Thursday? At any rate, I think you understand my point on this. Let's put that aside. My biggest issue with this, and Howard, you said it three or four times, you're looking for a minor variance. No, I'm looking for a variance. I didn't okay. describe it as minor. I it, described it, it as a variance. There was a couple times that you stated that it was a minor variance. I would like to understand how 52% reduction is a minor variance. I'm sorry, I don't recall using the word minor. If I did, I apologize. Can you, can you? I use the word variance because we're dealing with a zoning amendment. A zoning amendment can take a provision from 100% down to 0%. A variance cannot necessarily do that. So, if I may, from Mr. Osterhoff's report here, sorry, Mr. Chair, through you, um, it, it states in here, um, uh, sorry, however, planning neglected to mention that OMAFRA stated that there is latitude for reasonable cases when it comes to adjusting MDS, right, as, as he read it here in his report. So, I would like to, again, let me rephrase this, I would like to understand how a reduction of 52% is a reasonable case. I would submit to you the one overhead slide page that I showed with overall submissions where I went through eight points, mm -hmm. that is my answer. So you're suggesting that 
a 52% reduction is a reasonable case. I'm indicating to you that if you look at the history of the MDS, up until a year and a half ago, we may have been only here for a reduction of 2%. It's because of the reinterpretation of the way MDS is applied that we now have to double it. Okay, but all due respect, Howard, if we're going back in time, you know, if it wasn't for the places to grow, we wouldn't have as many houses happening in Paris as we do right now. So we can't really go with what's on the past. All I'm simply saying in here is the letter from your proponent states for a reasonable case, and you still haven't identified to me how 52% reduction is a reasonable case. Well, as I said, for the eight factors that I outlined on that one page, I feel it is reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions for the presenters? I have a couple of things that don't sit well with me. On Saturday, I spent the whole day in Burford at the Rod and Gun Club at an equal conference about forestry and about trees that fall down and the nutrients and the importance of trees that fall and what they do for the forest. And you made it sound like it was – someone made it sound like, you know, these forests are dying. I spent all day learning that things that are in the forest that have fallen over contribute a lot to the forest, and it regrows and it's home for bugs and birds and all kinds of things. So that's what I wanted to clear up there. That's not a bad thing that trees have fallen. And the thing that really offends me is you brought your presentation forward today with these circles and these rings and these colors, and the first time that you were questioned about them, you threw them under the bus. Yet it was the basis of your presentation tonight. You brought these to us, and the minute you were questioned about it, you said, well, I don't know that they're true because they were done by another company or another firm. So I just find that kind of insulting. Thank you. I think we will need to get your planner to give us some clarity on those numbers. But I suggest we do that a little later in the process. And if you would like to take your seats again, I would then move on to the public section. So is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this proposal? If you'd like to come forward, please. Is this one delegation or multiple delegations? No, it's already been done. No, it's already been done. Now you're up there. Could you give your name and address, please? Sharon Harris, 23 West Harris Road. Please continue. Good evening, Mayor Bailey, Councillors, Mr. Chairman, Planning Advisory Committee, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin my verbal presentation, I'd like to give you a visual image of what our farm has been like through the years, going back to the 1930s up to present day. That's the farmhouse in 1935. The 1950s. 1970. 85. 90. 92. I am Sharon Harris, and my husband Don and I own the farm at 23 West Harris Road. Our farm has been in the Harris family for over 100 years, spanning over five generations. Our grandson, Logan, who is with me tonight, a sixth-generation Harris, is currently in the process of moving to the farm. Logan will be commencing a farming operation of raising a variety of livestock. At the February 7th meeting of the Agriculture Advisory Committee, questions regarding restrictions imposed on livestock on our farm 
should Brant County endorse the amendment of 4.24A from the required MDS of 514 meters to 248 meters to create two residential lots were answered to some degree. However, no information was given, given regarding how the proposal will affect or interfere with any further expansion of our livestock housing facilities in the future. For example, should we wish to replace a barn if one were to be destroyed or to build a new barn, would we have to maintain the 514 minimum distance separation from the two houses being proposed? If this turns out to be the case, which probably it would, we would have to build a barn in the middle of the farm on arable land and not close to our other barns. There was a lot of confusion at the AAC meeting on February the 7th during the question period. In fact, at the end of the meeting, one member of the committee voiced to myself, another committee member, and a concerned neighbor that he had voted the wrong way and was upset about his error. We have been told that there are already restrictions on our farm due to the two houses that already exist within the current MDS guidelines. In 2003, when Nine West Terrace Road was created, the owner of the property, Mrs. Drake, was trying to get two lots by applying to sever a lot from the middle of her property along West Terrace Road. This, in effect, would have created three lots, one abutting right up to our property line, the one in the middle, and the one where 3 West Terrace Road is situated. We fought to maintain minimum distance separation at that time, and that is why 9 West Terrace Road is a lot over six acres in size, and the residence is situated on the far side of the property, away from our farm. At that time, we were assured that there would be no restrictions on our farm whatsoever. We were told that there would only ever be three houses on that road in addition to ours. This lot at 3 West Terrace Road should be grandfathered into the new system as MDS guidelines have now changed. As far as the house at 16 West Terrace Road is concerned, it was built in 1959, before the inception of MDS. Therefore, I don't feel that it should be considered. You know, as farmers, we fought to maintain this before, and here we go again. Throughout this entire process, we were not consulted as to our plans for the future of our farm or its history. It was assumed by Snodgrass Consulting that our farm was dormant. In his report dated October the 7th, Mr. Snodgrass noted, a recent inspection of the applicable farm operation shows that it has been inactive for many years. As I have stated, we were not consulted, nor did we give permission for any said inspection Perhaps it was a drive-by. No consideration has been given to us as farmers. Brant County prides itself as a county where agriculture is a main industry. The farming community should be protected now and for the future. In the 2012 official plan of Brant County, it is stated as an objective to ensure that agriculture operations are protected from land uses by incorporating the minimum distance separation formula in order to prevent adverse effects of odor. Should Brant County endorse this proposal to amend the bylaw, section 4.24A on minimum distance separation from the required 514 meters to 248 meters you would be setting a precedence, allowing residences to be created closer to farms than the current NDS guidelines stipulate. 
We engaged a consultant to calculate the MDS for our property and for this proposal. The two lots being sought are definitely within the recommended MDS for our farm. He said there's nothing to be argued about regarding his calculations, especially since he conversed with OMAFRA to thoroughly check things out. He also pointed out that this is not a minor variance. Now, I've heard that term several times throughout this whole pro process. Mr. Snodgrass denied it there tonight, but I don't think I have a hearing problem. It was referred to as a minor variance being sought. And the consultant felt it is not a minor variance. How far is Brant, willing, Brant County willing to bend the rules? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. This, as I repeat, as others have repeated tonight, is a 52% MDS reduction. And we too consider it no less than a major reduction. The Brant County bylaw states, notwithstanding other yard or setback provisions of this bylaw, to the contrary, no use shall be established and no buildings or structures shall be erected or altered unless it complies with the MDS guidelines developed by the Ontario Ministry of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs, OMAFRA. If this proposal is accepted, consultants would be able to refer to this precedent-setting decision to impact other farming operations throughout Brant County and possibly even province-wide. Further development on the West Terrace Road would definitely have a negative financial impact on our farm. A farm with restrictions cannot attain a value as great as one without. In closing, we are strongly opposed to any further development on West Harris Road and request that the County Council vote to comply with the current bylaw and reject this application. Your rejection would be in the best interest of all farmers in Brant County. Thank you from the Harris family, Don, Sharon, and Logan. And now I would like Logan to step forth. He has a few words as a young farmer beginning to farm. He'd like to say a few words to you. How are you doing tonight? My name's Logan Harris. Thank you for allowing me to speak on a matter that means so much to me. Um, this matter means very much to my family and myself. For the past three months, I've watched my grandparents fight to protect the family farm, while also seeing the mental and physical toll this has had on them. This is not only frustrating, but makes me apprehensive about my future as a farmer. I strongly believe the county should be following the provincial guidelines that are put into place to protect farmers. It should not be the ongoing responsibility of farmers to defend their land. The average age of a farmer is 54 years old and is increasing. In order to protect the future of Canada's domestic food supply, young people need to be encouraged to take up farming. Farms with restrictions discourages the growth of farming, especially when considering global issues such as economic and climate change that already deter the next generation of farmers. I'm coming here to create a sustainable farming operation and would like to be assured that my future on, my, on our family farm is protected by Brant County. You as my elected officials can assure that by voting to reject any amendment the M, by, to the MDS bylaw. Thank you for your time. I'm Dr. Langman. I live on 128 Brant School Road. I am a medical doctor and I'm a professor of medicine at McMaster University. I'll be relevant uh, during this discussion. I'm here to support my neighbors, uh, Sharon Harris. I'd like to thank Pam for presenting a well thought out decision. Uh, sorry, uh, Amanda. And uh, I'm not going to cover a lot of the things that she's already covered. 
However, I would like to say that the purpose of the MDS is to prevent land use conflicts, and this is very important, and odor complaints in particular. The increasing residential density proposed here will increase odor complaints, and odor complaints are actually a public health issue. There's many studies in peer-reviewed literature demonstrating that farm odor, and this is not a slight on the farming people here, but that farm odor modifies behavior, mood, emotions among residents living near farms. It affects their quality of life, causes irritation of the eyes, the nose, throat, headaches, nausea, stress, sleep disturbances, depression, and exacerbates asthma and other respiratory diseases. There's multiple uh, evidence from the literature demonstrating this. I've put up a number of the references. <clears throat> Odor exposure from livestock farming is estimated from, through distance to the animal houses and the residences. There are two farms. There's the Harris Farm, indicated by the yellow line, with an MDS of 545 meters extending over the property in question, designated by a black box. And then there's a Scott farm in the red, with a red line there, with an MDS of 533 based on his website. <clears throat> I've heard today that in 2017 the rules changed, but the rules did not change. There's a previous ruling by Brant County itself, which Amanda has and has given to me, which showed that there was a previous attempt to separate this property into two or more lots and that was denied based on the MDS. In addition, an MDS of 533 using type B criteria was produced by the Brant County Plan at Janet Crook in 2003. MAFRA does not support or encourage reductions for good reasons. As I stated before, there are many reasons to support the MDS. Granting a reduction will lead to further reductions in MDS and the number of applications across, across this county. <clears throat> there are two uh, rules that you can use. There's guideline 12 and guideline 43. Guideline 12 does not apply in the case of the Harris Farm. Guideline 43, as we have heard today, is actually for environmental and public health or safety reasons. It is not to build residential properties. There's another issue that Mrs. Harris has raised, and that is that the MDS, if it's set back and then these houses are allowed to be built, it will impact her farm. An MDS 2 calculation was prepared for her farm. If she was to extend her farm by 30 cows and 30 alpacas by building an extra building, she would be limited by these new residences at 230 meters. The intervening house there that we see is on agriculture land. Based on guideline 41, this will only cause a type A reduction or calculation, whereas new residences may cause a type B calculation, and that causes this MDS calculation of 230 meters. This could impact your farm. I'm not going to talk about the Scott farm in great detail because Amanda already talked about this, but I would like to point something out. This is the building that Mr. Snodgrass is using as a setback. Using Google Maps, it is 545 meters away from the barn on the Scott Farm. As you can see, if you were to rotate that line to the property in question, it covers it. There's nowhere to build a house on that property. We don't support this application requires a massive reduction in the MDS, increases residential density, which increases the risk of odor complaints. Odor has public health implications. Odor complaints financially impact farmers. New residences near the Harris Farm will restrict her development, and this sets a precedent for future applications reducing MDS all across Brant County. Thank you. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, and Councillors. Uh, I'm David Bolke. I live, I live at uh, 9 West Harris Road. In the uh, December 3rd Council meeting, Mr. Snodgrass made a comment regarding the white plank forest that covers 3 and 9 West Harris Road. He said, and I quote, 
The key is with reforestation plots, they don't last forever. They generally die off. Now, it's true that the Oosterhof forest requires attention. However, the solution to an ailing forest uh, should not be its replacement with houses, septic beds, and driveways. Instead, woodlot owners should remove dead and diseased trees, as, as I have done over the past 10 years, and if necessary, plant trees. For example, I planted 30 maples on my property and have allowed for the natural establishment of maple, oak, walnut, birch, and other species I can't identify. The uh, Carolinian forest is slowly encroaching into the pine forest, and this is a good thing given that monoculture is not a healthy predicament for any ecosystem. Additionally, our tree cutting bylaw encourages good forestry practices. And I would encourage all lot owners to read uh, the tree cutting bylaw. With my little intervention, Mother Nature is restoring my forest to health. If you were to use Google Earth with West Harris Road as ground zero, just zoom out a few thousand feet and what you will not see are forests. There remains only a few clumps of trees here and there with remnants of a Carolinian forest lining Fairchild's Creek. We should therefore protect what few woodlots we have. The West Harris Pine Forest is not irretrievably lost. Because saplings were planted 35, 40 years ago, the pine trees are still young. They can live for 150, even 200 years. In uh, Tomogamy Provincial Park, there are healthy eastern white pines that are 400 years old. So these trees that are on that on our forest, they can be restored to health. They're young trees, they're adolescent trees. White pines are a superlative species and should be protected. Perhaps that's why they are the official tree of Ontario and have been designated by the Iroquois First Nations as the tree of peace. Ten years ago, my family and I moved to the country, uh, to the county, uh, from a typical city neighborhood. We moved to Brown County seeking privacy, bucolic vistas, dark night skies, and diversity of flora and fauna. We found what we were looking for in West Harris Road. And I don't know why or how this happened, but a little piece of heaven fell on West Harris Road. And I think uh, Sharon Harris probably had something to do with this. So let's not do anything to despoil the neighborhood, because the application under consideration does not support any of the benefits and pleasures of living in the county. It only diminishes what's good about living in Brown County. But most important, let's do what's right for our farmers. Someday Don and Sharon Harris will bequeath their farm to their grandson. Help Logan Harris by not placing any additional restrictions on, his, on their farm. Allow the Harris's to farm as they see fit for generations to come. Thank you. I'm Sandra Voss. I'm here representing Brent County Federation of Agriculture. I am the president and I'm here on behalf of our board of directors. I speak tonight briefly uh, from two points of view. One, it's been a fascinating process to see what happens when MDS 140 pages can be used to interpret either side of an argument. And I appreciate all the time and energy that the council has had to spend on this for this part. For Mr. Snodgrass's analysis, it's very detailed. I went to go to read the report on the uh, website tonight and I was blocked, so I'm not sure why. So I couldn't make my comments as detailed as I wanted to. So I would just like to say that on behalf of the directors, I'm speaking against the rezoning application based on the effect it will have on an MDS-1 policies for the agricultural land and farmers in the future. It's the future I'm concerned about. Currently, MDS-1 policies were set to ensure appropriate distances separated livestock buildings from inconveniencing neighbors and non-farming buildings. It is also used to secure the future activities of a farmer in the event of a change of livestock or type of farming occurs. And for that, without a crystal ball, no one knows what that farm's going to do in five to 20 years. The applicant and his team are asking for a zoning bylaw setback reduction from 514 to 248 meters. Although, whatever you want to call it, this is not a minor 10% reduction change. 
and it does not consider the agricultural impact to the Harris family. It certainly considers the impact to the builder who wants to put up the two homes. If a farmer came to council and asked for this reduction to build a new livestock farm, barn, the neighbors would be out in force, as previous history has demonstrated. MDS guidelines were set to try and contain the problems that arise when lots are severed, resold, and new owners move in who are unfamiliar with the realities of farming life. Mostly dust, noise, flies, smells, and machinery operation at all hours through harvest. We get that Ontario rural needs to grow populations. We understand that. And we applauded as a group when we heard that Paris was going to infill multi-level building. Services would be well used, lesser infrastructure, better footprint. We applaud the council for having that thought. And we understand that the County of Baran, upon amalgamation of all your townships, you have inherited a hodgepodge of previously severed lots handled in a variety of ways and not always with the same careful consideration that our present staff is planners must adhere to. These inconsistencies can be resolved by consistently applying MDS guidelines to rezoning applications. Brant County Federation of Agriculture strongly supports the zoning applications that adhere to the MDS guidelines to ensure the well-being of our agricultural industry. Therefore, Brant County Federation of Agriculture recommends that this application be rejected, and we look to the Council for leadership in continuing the thriving agricultural industry we have here. Thank you. Would you like to speak? Mr. Mayor, good evening, Mr. Chair, and members of the planning committee, and members of the public, and Amanda. Thank you, Amanda, for all the work and for all your support during this process and for providing information so I can speak tonight with more um, basis. On December 3rd, I spoke to you um, rejecting this amendment. Tonight, I come again, and I would like just to give you more information about my concerns and a little bit more facts on those. At, at that time, I mentioned that it was very important for us in Brown County to follow this strategic priority one, which is sustainable and man manage growth in the county. And, and this is very important for us because this is our small community. This is unique to us. You can see we have three farms and we have a few houses and our street is really small and the, the natural feature of our street is the forest. We, we are asking you to comply with policy and by law. For us, these are the three most important policies and by law that we are asking to, to be concerned with. Um, one of them is the uh, to protect the prime agricultural areas for the long-term use, to ensure that agricultural operations complies with minimum distance separation, and to allow for setbacks, but only within the MDS guidelines. The proposed loads are within the MDS of, three, of the three barns, as Amanda put it on her report. Then actually, you were not only given a pass on one farm, but we will give in a pass on all the other because they intersect. Um, you were talking, Mr. Ednogras uh, mentioned that the, the MDS changed within the last year. This is not true. Also, uh, Mr. Osterhoff said that I have misled the committee. 
and mention things that are not correct. I would like to clarify this information for him as he probably didn't know. But in 2003, all the lots on this property were owned by Three Harris Road. It doesn't matter if it was Mrs. Ray or if it's Mr. Rosman. It's, it was Three Harris Road. At that time, I took some information from the planning um, uh, planning report in 2003. As you can read there, they mentioned that when two lots will result in a rural residential cluster and required that land use type B be used in calculating the MDS setback. And that is why they recommend only the creation of one load to merge those two loads, create only one load, and therefore we will use the small MDS. But they were aware at that time that if they will create a cluster, then the larger MDS will apply. And this is what happened because this application was in October, and then later in November, they applied for the severance of other two more lots. At that moment, then they create a cluster of lots. Then it's been known, at least for Three Harris Road property, that the MDS will always be and MDS one, the largest distance. And at that time, as you can see on the, on the chart, on the bottom picture, an MDS of 429 was the man, even in 2003, for the next developments. Now, MDS has grown because from being only double, it went to 2.2. Now it's larger. And at that time, here's the application and, and like I said, seven, uh, nine West Water Road was applied in October. Then it came the other two lots that were on Brown School Road. That was in November. And then there is this MDS application in December 10, and it has a rejection. Then I hope this clarifies the MDS issue. We ask you as well to contemplate that if you were to approve the two laws, there are other laws and policies that have to comply with. And one of them is the land use policies. The pattern of new development shall be logical in the context of the existing development within the rural or residential area, and the proposed development is compatible with existing development. I took this information from Service Ontario, so there is no doubt about the measures of the lots. I took eight properties. I removed one that which area is too large to be considered to get a proper average. And I got that around this property, the property size are around 12,000 square meters. The proposed loads, are 4,000 and only one of 8,000, which means lot one and two will be only one third of the average of the property size in the area. And lot three will be two thirds. We also would like you to contemplate the environmental impact, which already my husband talked about it, and also was mentioned on Amanda's report. It's important that the, this white pine trees. As you can see in the picture, this is an actual picture of our forest. They do improve the air quality. They help us with climate mod moderation. They provide a habitat for wildlife and filters water flowing into the fir creek and also in our water beds. Uh, because we, this is farm, there are a lot of f um, chemicals that go through the land and the roots and the systems creates like a natural frustration system for our drinkable water. Um, we know that these um, wood laws are, have to comply with tree conservation bylaws. And Amanda already mentioned that in her report. And this property has a wood lot designation and is, in our opinion, that to accommodate the houses that they want with garage, parking lots, septic beds, green area for the backyard, et cetera, 
probably close to two acres of uh, the pine forest will have to go and clear out. We, our street is small, our community is really small, and it's a nice community. We are flame friendly, it's a friendly community. We used to get along very well, everybody there. Um, if you increase, uh, put those two new houses, you increase 50%, the house density on West Harris Road, we will have privacy issues. And as you know, when you buy a countryside property, the most important thing that add value to a property is privacy and the natural features of the property, then this application would not be beneficial, that it will be affecting everybody there. Water issues, are we already spoke about it, and they are also addressed in their own environmental report. They also mentioned that it will be an issue with uh, water there. The environmental study is not complete, and as uh, Amanda mentioned already, there are a lot of issues uh, with that report. In summary, we respectfully ask the members of this planning and development committee to support a staff recommendation. And we thank Amanda for the detailed report that she provided. And we ask the council and the members of this committee to keep supporting a strategy priority number one, which is sustainable and management growth. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chair. Can I ask if there anybody else that would like to speak on this issue? for a second time, or maybe a final time. I'll close the public input part of this. Um, I think there was one question that, that needs to be resolved, and that was a technical question. I think perhaps the fellow could come back and just clarify the uh, numbers that we see on MDS calculations. Thank you. Through, this, through the chair. Pardon? Um, it's my understanding that that figure was prepared previously before I was with the county. It's basically showing the difference between the type A calculation and the type B calculation. That's what that figure is demonstrating. Councilor Mayor, are you comfortable with that answer? Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would the uh, applicants or agents wish to rebut anything? I'll uh, end our comments uh, the way I began, and that is the issue before you this evening is indeed uh, one as to MDS. And that, um, I think I said at the outset that this was not a request for a minor variance, it was a request for a variance to MDS. And you know that that could be accomplished by a minor variance with a committee of adjustment if it was, but we deemed it more appropriate to go to this council uh, for a zoning bylaw amendment. So the test is not minor, it's whether it's reasonable. And we submit to you that the Harris Farm is already constrained. We submit to you that this approval of this reduction will not adversely impact on the Harris Farm, and that makes it reasonable. The issue of the Scott Farm, I've not read or heard anything that says that is not in compliance. And that highlights the different issues here is because there's four homes between the Scott Farm and the subject lots. And so a different scale is applied. And whereas there's only two here. And so the larger scale is applied and we applied to reduce it and do not in our submission adversely impact on um, the Harris Farm. I don't believe that that was stated by Mr. Crinklaw uh, at the uh, Ag Advisory Committee meeting, uh, nor has anyone else uh, shown that there are more constraints as a result of the approval of this application. The constraints are already existing because of the existing homes. The um, Last thing is just that I think that um, it should be said in, in, in defense of Mr. Ustroff and his presentation 
uh, that he put a, did put a, lot, a great deal of thought into that and brought it uh, to you and put it to you in writing and that is the same opportunity that others have. We did not see any of the uh, objector's presentations until tonight either. We weren't provided with those. And I just, I don't think Mr. Oosterhoff uh, should be criticized, quite frankly, for giving you um, his full presentation and thoughts, and not only verbally, uh, but in, in writing. So thank you for that. I answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. I think we'll move the agenda along now to uh, let the committee make its conclusion. So would anybody like to propose a, uh, a motion? Dr. Cannon, do you propose this? I'll move the recommendation to Mr. Bell. Okay. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor McAlpine? Comments on that motion? Councillor McFerrin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I just want to thank everybody on, on all sides of this uh, issue for presenting. Every presentation was thoughtful and um, well thought out and clearly delivered. Um, my sort of statement is just that uh, MDS is one of the few tools we have that's reliable and given to us by the province to restrict development effectively. Uh, it allows for smarter growth. It helps prevent future issues and neighbor disputes. It supports farmers and agribusiness, which is our county and our country's number one economic driver. And therefore, I think we should support MDS by rejecting the application. Mr. Cullen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I am supporting uh, the recommendation uh, I do have mixed feelings on this on this whole application. Um, I think Ms. Voss said it perfect. We are dealing with the situation of former municipalities that we are now amalgamated and trying to deal with their situations that was created 25 years ago or better. Um, as a farmer, I have to believe in the MDS. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it and it is there to protect us as Councilor Ferrier said. But I also understand where the applicant is coming from in another sense is that that lot is not taking any land out of agriculture purposes at this time. It was at one time and it was reforested. So I understand that, but I, I do have mixed feelings on this whole thing, but I think I am not supporting, I am supporting the recommendation of staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other comments from the committee? If not, then I'll call the vote. All those in, in favour of the staff recommendation, which is to refuse the application. Those against? Motion carried. This will go to council in three weeks' time for final ratification. I'm going to suggest we take a two-minute break uh, to allow the... Uh, Fire off. Go away. We're good. All right. Thank Go ahead, you. <laughs> uh, through the chair, staff are recommending approval of zoning bylaw amendment for 42 Brant Mill Road for the purpose of removing a site-specific provision on the lands to go undergo a subsequent severance application and merger. The subject lands are located on located south of the Oakland Road and Brant Mills Road's intersection and are located on the east side of Brant Mills Road. They're approximately 3.86 hectares in size and are currently occupied by a single detached dwelling, detached garage, and workshop. Within the county and brand official plan, the subject plans have been designated as agricultural. The applicant is under, oh, sorry. The applicant is undertaking the rezoning application in order to facilitate a surplus dwelling severance and merger. The subject lands have been zoned as agricultural with site specific provision A13, which permits a service shop. The applicants are proposing to sever a parcel with an area of approximately 0 0.76 hectares, which will include the existing house, garage, and shop. The retained lands are to be merged with the parcel to the south, municipally known as 22 Brant Mill Road. The total merged parcel will have an area of approximately 31.1 hectares. The rezoning application is needed for the retained lands to remove the site-specific provision. This will prevent the merged lands from having the ability to build a shop through the site-specific provision. No new residential building lots will be created. The house and associated structures are to be severed with the retained lands being merged. The severance application is permitted by the official plan as minimal agricultural lands are being removed and the severed lands are minimal, minimal and the proposed lot lines follow the natural lines of the property. In regards to next steps, should the rezoning be approved, 
A subsequent severance application will be processed by staff. This application will have its own circulation and commenting period. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee should have. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Would the committee uh, like to ask Amanda any questions? Seeing none, thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, would the applicant or the agent of the applicant like to speak to this application? Uh, could you just give us your name just for the record? Yeah. My name is Maria Kinkle with MHN Lawyers. I have nothing to add to the planner's report, just here in the case of questions. Thank you. To the public, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this application? Ask a second time, and a third time. Seeing none, I suggest that we then move on and uh, bring the matter to the committee. What, how would the committee like to move forward, please? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Three, you move to approve. Seconded by Councillor Hunt. Uh, comments on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favour? Those against? Motion carried. Again, this will come to the council meeting in approximately three weeks' time. Okay, moving on. We have a change of planner. Um, item 9C is zoning bylaw amendment 3219 for Haley's Elevators, Inc. at the address 2913 Concession Road. Chairman, this is three for three. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, staff have received a uh, zoning bylaw amendment application, uh, ZBA uh, 3219 BM, for the property located uh, at 2913 Concession Road. Uh, and the staff are recommending that the application be approved uh, this evening. So this application first came to, to the uh, Planning Advisory Committee uh, back in November of uh, 2019. The application, uh, I've highlighted the subject lands in red, um, and then the dashed line there is, is the settlement boundary. So um, the property subject lands are quite large, and a large portion of those lands are, uh, do fall within the settlement area of, settlement area of Scotland. So um, the area total for the red outlined uh, subject land is about 67 hectares, and there's approximately 55% of those lands that are within the settlement boundary, um, secondary settlement boundary of Scotland. So the lands are currently designated uh, suburban residential, or a portion of the lands within the settlement boundary are designated suburban residential. Uh, and you can see the lands uh, kind of in that off-white color to the west. That's the portion that are uh, designated agricultural. And those lands are, are not developable. The current zoning on the entire subject lands uh, is agricultural. And again, I've just, I've I just want to keep identifying that that uh, the limits of the settlement boundary because it is uh, kind of essential for um, the committee to understand, as well as uh, played an important role in staff's review. So the proposal is to to rezone a, a small portion of those subject lands, uh, essentially to create um, or, or to allow for the creation or subsequent application to propose the creation of four lots. Um, a good example of what those lots may look like uh, identified on the screen. Uh, so the, the application is to rezone uh, the portion identified in the aerial image to the no on the top part of the screen um, from agricultural to suburban residential. And again, this is to facilitate uh, subsequent applications. So as part of the, the initial circulation back in November, we did have some concerns from the budding property owner who does operate a, a kennel use since that time, uh, we have provided the, the kennel um, operation with a, a response addressing kind of some of some of their concerns, uh, and the response to that by the applicant. And this this uh, little snapshot of the four lots is not included in your package, but it is a, a response to to the initial concern, and it does include uh, consideration for an enhanced buffer between uh, that <coughs> proposed lot or proposed residence and the kennel use. Uh, there is uh, an option for staff to review at a later, um, perhaps through the severance application, to orientate the building and the, or the dwelling in a different way where the habitable, 
habitable portion of the dwelling is farther away from the kennel use and the garage is on, you know, kind of buffering between. And then there's the opportunity to provide future owners with the knowledge and the information of what does exist in the immediate area. So as part of the review, staff uh, had um, has done a detailed review of, of the applicable policy. Uh, we note that uh, Scotland, although it, it is a secondary settlement boundary, it does not uh, have services. So the, the, the proposed development of low density is, is appropriate given the level of services that are available. The, uh, the official plan um, policies Staff also recognized that the proposed lot creation or rezoning to facilitate the lot creation is appropriate, consistent form of development uh, on private services within the second second settlement area. I, I should add that as part of the review and kind of the, the time it's taken for this application to come back in November to now, uh, we have been working with, with the, uh, the applicant and their agents to uh, just confirm that the proposed rezoning uh, is not going to negatively impact the ability to, to develop that large portion of undevelopable land. So we were playing around with some, some uh, road connections and, and lot layouts, nothing that meant anything other than showing there are, uh, there are options available and, and very good options available uh, in the future when the time is appropriate. So at this time, uh, planning analysis has regard for the applicable policy consultation with, uh, with departments and inspection of the subject lands as well as uh, ongoing discussions with the applicant and the agent and therefore planning staff are recommending approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you. Do the committee have any questions of Dan? Yes, sir. Councilor Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Dan, can you go back to that um, enhanced garage buffer? Because <laughs> um, what, what does that look like? What, is that a fence? Is that uh, trees? What, what is that? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't, I don't believe it's been uh, identified in, in any detail, but it co could include um, vegetation, plantings, fence, a number of things. And, and that would be reviewed uh, in greater detail at the time of the, uh, the severance applications. The applicants will be provided or will be required to provide a detailed site development plan much like you see up on the screen that will be reviewed by staff and we'll be, at that time we'll be able to, to uh, ensure that the, uh, the buffer is, is appropriate. Okay, and then the second question. Um, when, you, when, it was this, when we went through the uh, information um, meeting, you, you, you talked about um, leapfrogging or, or trying to have sequential development. Um, clearly this isn't, but you feel that's okay because you don't see it um, adversely impacting anything to come in the future. Is that correct? That's right. I think, I think that's what you said. Yep, said. exactly. Um, through you, Mr. <coughs> Chair, that was, that was the, um, it's the approach that planning staff have, have always taken with a number of applications. We want to we approach things holistically and, and kind of identify how things could build out um, if, they, if they were to build out. And that was what we worked with the applicant on to identify that we're not limiting ourselves uh, for future development of those lands. And we're not going to put sidewalks to those four items Correct. in the immediate future. Okay, thank you. Councillor Phoenix. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, just a little bit further clarification on the, on the buffer, if I could. So is the buffer going to be part of that first lot, or is there going to be a buffer and then the first lot will start beside the buffer and, and go lower down west, I guess. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Pierce, the, it was the recommendation of the, the applicant and, uh, and the owner that the buffer be as part of that initial first part. Lot. Okay, thank you. Councilor Duffy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the um, planner. Yeah, the um, letter from Cahoons had suggested instead of one row of trees, a double row of trees, and evergreens are probably the best buffer um, along that line. And I see that you have increased the lot size because that was also a suggestion so that there would be more 
space to plant more trees and perhaps adjust the position of the house. So I'm glad to see the, the larger lot there and um, the um, trees, would they be required to be planted along the rear property line as well as the um, property line, the longest lot line there, which is um, what direction? South, no, east, east, east lot line. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatwood, the, uh, to respond. The, the buffer is, is simply a recommendation uh, or a response uh, to the, the concerns of the abutting land use, uh, land user. And so this is, this is their, um, their offer as, well, this is a, a, a great way to mitigate any future concerns, noise. Um, we can certainly look at the specifics um, at the consent or severance stage and at that time we'll be able to, um, the same concerns will be identified to the Committee of Adjustment and if they sh uh, choose to and, and staff have the ability to as well, um, impose uh, sp specific conditions related to development of that lot. Thank you, I, I, I ask that because I'm concerned because as um, the neighbors with the kennel have said, if these houses were already there and they were applying for a kennel, they would never get it. But it's now the other way around. The kennel's been there for over 20 years and I just don't want a lot of bylaw enforcement issues because we're allowing these houses there. So thank you for making um, buffers and anything that will help. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I had the same concerns. I remember the lady from the kennel speaking, and I think we talked about a variation of different things. It could be a berm, it could be fencing, it could be trees. It, so she would be she would be um, part of that discussion, wouldn't she? The neighbor, because she because she has brought it to our attention quite clearly that you know it wouldn't be happening in reverse, as Councillor Gatward said. So would she be? Would she be in the conversation as to what that buffer will be, whether it berms and trees and fencing? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd, uh, I had forwarded this, this plan to, uh, to the kennel owner uh, as soon as it was received while we were formulating a response to her comments at the information meeting, and I had not received any, any negative feedback from, from that owner, so I, I believe I would take that as... Uh, as being satisfied. However, uh, at the severance stage, as an abutting property owner, she will also be uh, circulated again, so we'll have an opportunity to to raise any concerns. Thank you. Councilor Coleman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure this question should be for you, Dan, or should be for the uh, for the applicant. Uh, uh, I see on your, on your op there you've got uh, four different driveways. Is that something that have you looked at Complying that and splitting the driveways only two driveways coming in off the road and when I know 13th is not a high traffic road, but um, The less driveways we have in some of these roads the, bit, the better we are. So that's just a comment Thanks. Uh, Just uh, through you mr. Chairman to the planner uh, just for a question of clarification uh, The kennel property is that property zoned uh, To allow a kennel through you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the, the kennel property is, is not zoned to permit the kennel. It is, the kennel is a, a legal non-conforming use, so that it is allowed to continue until it ceases to exist. Any further questions for Dan? If not, Dan, thank you. Uh, would the agent or the applicant to the agent like some concerns? Mr. Chairman, Your Worship, members of the committee, Bob Phillips and J.H. Coon Engineering Limited, representing uh, Haley Al Elevator on this application for rezoning. As the planner uh, noted, there's uh, the land holding is probably close to 68 hectares. 
of which are 67, 68 hectares, of which about 40 is designated uh, in the OP as suburban residential. Uh, the application tonight is for the four lots. Uh, I think the planner did a great job not only answering questions but describing the application, so I'm not going to try to go through that all again. Uh, we are aware of the uh, a letter that was produced back in October, uh, and at that time we kind of modified the lot layout to increase the size of the lot, uh, and that's what our application to the Committee of Adjustment is for, and we're certainly uh, amenable to the, the proposed buffer. I sort of visualized myself a combination of bourbon vegetation in that area, uh, but we're certainly open to any further discussions uh, about that buffer. Um, short of that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Any questions for the uh, AG? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, to the public. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? If so, would you please come forward? <coughs> My name is uh, Jennifer McCauley. I own Chris Haven Kennels, which is adjacent to the, uh, um, the um, proposed amendment property. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm afraid, I'm not sure that I'm going to be much use tonight. Um, normally my daughter's the one that, that talks, so that's who you can remember. Um, but I do have some objection, and she wasn't able to come this evening. Um, Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I apologize for not submitting a written statement earlier, but we just I didn't get notice of the proceedings until 24 hours ago. Many of you will remember my daughter who spoke on my behalf at the previous meeting. And in support of the written submissions I made at the time opposing the proposed land amendment and stating the issues I have with the amendment, I still have those issues. Um, the letter I received in October um, very clearly stated that the new owners of the property that would be buying these, this, these properties were not to be informed of the kennel, existing kennel. It's a buyer beware um, situation in Southern Ontario. That's not fair on the new owners and it's not fair on me. I have never, ever had a noise complaint in the 30 years that I've been in, uh, in operation at this address. But, I mean, dogs do bark. And a buffer, I have a good friend that has spent over $90,000 on buffers trying to keep their dogs at a, a decent noise level. Now, I don't think that my dogs do a lot of barking. I happen to have breeds of dogs that, um, two breeds, but they don't bark. I'm very lucky, but I do try to do a little bit of boarding, and they bark. And I would hate to have to start thinking and worrying all the time about neighbors. I never have had to. As I say, I've never had a complaint. <clears throat> I have managed to run a successful, thriving business that is world-renowned. I have sold dogs all over the world, and uh, I have a lot of people that come from great distances to buy my dogs, and they can't help but produce uh, some revenue to other people in Brant County. They come and they stay overnight at a hotel, motel, and then they eat, they shop, I've also been a reputable employer for the last 30 years. Uh, currently, I hire, I have three citizens of the local uh, community working for me besides my three of my grandchildren. And then my daughter and my daughter-in-law are additionally both very active in the family business. I am deeply committed to my kennel and dogs as it has taken a lifetime of devotion to garner this international reputation. 
and my achievements in the breed. I have been breeding golden retrievers for 55 years, and it is a legacy I want to leave to my family who has shared my investment in the business. Suffice it to say, this business is and always has been much about much more than making a living, though of course it is also my means of doing just that. I oppose the current amendment because I feel that the proximity of the development to follow will jeopardize my position in the committee, in the community, and in my business. Thus far, we have enjoyed a good relationship with the townspeople of Scotland, yet there is some distance between my kennel and other residences. Will the with this amendment, there will be very little separating my business and the new development. When I first had to get amendments to the bylaw, um, the proximity of the closest residence had to be 900 meters. The closest building was 600 meters, and that's why I had to get the amendment. Um, these homes are going to be <laughs> four acres close to me. That's not uh, 900 meters. That's about, uh, I would say, about 300 yards. You're still doing me with the old. I will have no control over who purchases the proposed housing or whether they will be informed of the nature of my pre-existing business prior to their purchase. When I first applied for the kennel license, I had many hum uh, hoops to jump through most of it involving the proximity of the closest houses. I didn't have to just go to the close houses to appeal my position and ask for them a statement saying that they would allow my kennel, but I had to go to every property owner that owned property adjacent to my property. And some of the people lived in Hamilton, some of them in Brantford, and uh, it didn't matter, I still had to go to them and ask if I would be allowed. And it, you know, it made sense because the level of noise naturally associated with my business and a desire to avoid a flood of unfounded bylaw complaints, those houses are much further away than the proposed housing will be. There is no way I would be able to obtain a kennel license of those houses were, had been established first, the proposed houses. If they were already up there, I would not get a kennel license. It just doesn't seem to make sense or it doesn't seem to be fair that I've been there for 30 years and as soon as the houses are up, am I going to have to start fighting noise complaints? And it's all going to be on me. The planner told me that they would not be informed of the, the existing kennel. As I say, I oppose this proposed amendment and the development that will likely follow because it cannot be compatible with the ongoing operation of my pre-existing business. Logically, it is impossible to reconcile the proximity requirements that were so stringently enforced when I established my business and which are now at risk of being removed. The risk this proposed amendment poses to my business threatens my financial security and threatens the valuable economic contribution it makes to the wider community. The family business draws visitors from all over the world, employs local citizens, is my sole source of income, my retirement fund, and my legacy to leave my children and grandchildren. The thought of losing this is unbearable to me. It should also be unbearable to this community that we have been a part of for 30 plus years. It is simply not in the country's best interest, the county's best interest, thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, we'll uh, just a second there. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, well, let's have questions. Can you just hold on a second, please? Oh, okay. I forgot, would you like to ask a question? Certainly. <clears throat> yeah, it's a clarification, if I might. Um, because you said you got approval, and I guess the correspondence in October says that you got approval in 
1988, and we secured the necessary amendment to the bylaw to establish our kennel. And you said you had to go around to the neighbors. Right. So I don't understand, Mr. Chairman, why the planner said the zoning isn't right when was the zoning from 1998 not carried forward into the county zoning bylaw? We can have our planner clarify that. Okay. Uh, through Mr. Chair, <coughs> the, uh, I, did, I did check the property file and the information that is available to us, and I did not see um, the, the zoning that I did not see evidence that the zoning has been carried forward. So at this, at this current stage, uh, with our current zoning, it is, it is agricultural. And um, as we know, as, as the committee knows, that kennel uses and boarding facilities are not permitted um, in, any, in any zone, and typically they are permitted through a site-specific zoning, um, which we've seen a number of them come to this committee. Um, so this uh, staff's understanding is that this application is, or this property is, is zoned agricultural and that the use is therefore considered legal nonconforming. But previously, uh, the townships issued, I believe, kennel licenses for requests for kennels. Um, and that's how the, many of them were allowed to operate. And I'm sure some of the... Could I answer uh, that? I, uh, I have Do you have paperwork from that? I didn't even think of bringing it, but I do pay. I, I have a kennel license that, re, that is renewed every year. That and I have to provide a list of dogs that I have that, um, and proof of the rabies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hyde, you have a question and clarification? A uh, question for our planner, for you, Mr. Chair. Is that uh, can we save that for the oh, kennel yeah, sorry. Chairs? Is there anybody else uh, from the public who would like to speak to this application? Uh, I'll ask a second time and a third time. Seeing none, I will bring the issue back to committee. And I think we can deal with your question up in that round of comments. Uh, Councillor Howard, would somebody like to make a recommendation to committee? Councillor Coleman? I'll move the recommendation. Do we have a second there? Councillor Chambers? Would you like to speak to it? Yes, I would like to speak to the recommendation if I could, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I'll ask for a clear up Mr. Uh, Council Howe's uh, issue. Right. Through you, Mr. Chair, question for Dan. Um, could you clarify the, uh, we understand from the um, kennel owner uh, about the buyer, the let the buyer beware factor, but then on one of the slides we, we noted that there could be communication future owner information. So can you just clarify for us on what we can and can't do in terms of, of letting a future buyer of the first property or two um, about the situation? Sure, so uh, through Mr. Chair, the, the response that was provided to the initial concerns identified essentially the, these three items. Um, one is that uh, unfortunately the use the use, of, even if uh, there were noise complaints, if the use was permitted, the bylaw would still enact um, and enforce um, and investigate any any concerns. That was kind of the the response from bylaw for um, for that aspect of it. Um, and there was a there was there is an opportunity to provide an enhanced buffering um, orientation of the building, as well as uh, notify the future users that uh, there is a, a sensitive use next door. Unfortunately, um, the thing about legal nonconforming use is that it's, the intention is that they eventually go away. Um, it's not, you know, the use is allowed to continue, um, like I said, until it doesn't exist or it stops or they need to expand and, and get a, a minor a rezoning perhaps to, to permit that use. Um, in terms of uh, providing that information to future owners, um, perhaps there's a number of ways we can do that through agreements 
um, through um, registering uh, the information on title. Um, I'm sure I'm sure the uh, staff could come up with some options. Through you, Mr. Chair, follow up question. Well, just and clarification. So we can tell the future owner that there's a kennel next door. Um, that doesn't really change whether or not they phone by law every day. Um, and is and not knowing this area personally, are, are there big signs up that say, hey, we got golden retrievers here? No, no there sign. Is sign. There is a sign. Oh, wait. Right, okay. Right. Good point. You don't know. Oh, okay. But there, there's, there's some obvious. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but while you're uh, answering the wrong question, uh, the, the legal non conforming uh, status, if the current right. owner passes it down to a children, that's okay? That's still that's correct. non conforming yep. status? Okay, thank you. Councillor Chambers. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, just speaking to the uh, recommendation, I do support the recommendation, but I do have some uh, uh, questions of our planning staff that, that uh, uh, can be uh, perhaps answered uh, prior to the recommendation going to council, and that is with regard to the zoning on the property. I may be wrong, and, and first of all, let me say there's a, a distinct difference between a kennel license and a property zoned for a kennel. And I seem to recall in my past that there was an application for a kennel uh, uh, zoning application. And the owner of the property alluded to that. So my question to staff is, could you please research that uh, property in terms of an agricultural extended use zoning application and approval uh, because th there's a big difference between an approved zoning uh, agricultural extended use and a legal non-conforming use and the difference is if the property is sold the zoning goes with the property and again I may be wrong on this and this is why I'm asking that it be double checked and triple checked because the applicant if they have gone through a zoning application for an extended use to allow a kennel on the property and somehow that has been taken away by bureaucracy, then that should not have happened. So I want that checked uh, and brought forward for information at our plan at our council meeting when this recommendation uh, it eventually goes there. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll do that for you. Any, any further comments? No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one question. I don't know if our planner will know it or if you'll know it or if somebody else on staff will know it, but <clears throat> part of the issue is about getting the um, the word out that this is a kennel, which you know, may be obvious, may not be. I haven't been to that site. Um, are we able to amend our CIP program to help them create new and better signage that would be more clear? I know they're not part of one of our downtown zones, but we've talked about that in the past, about exemptions for CIP. Would that be something we could do? Okay, back to Mayor Vance, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, the uh, CIP referring to the Community Improvement Plan? Yeah. Yeah, normally that's applied to a specific area, like a downtown mm -hmm. core or something like that. Um, I think what you might be referring to is, is more uh, the grant uh, program, the new sign bylaw, what would be would be an appropriate thing. But again, I mean, these people have an existing sign that indicates that they, they have a kennel on the property, and I don't think we would impose a sign on them, like, in other words, make them put another sign up. What we could do is we could request that the applicant, as part of the, the future severance application, put a sign on the lots that says, you know, beware, this, this, this property abuts a, uh, a kennel operation. I mean, that's very fair. We, we see that oftentimes with, with properties where um, uh, a multi a multifamily uh, project, vacant lot, about single family. It, it advises purchasers that, hey, something's coming here. You know, don't, don't buy on the single family lot and then complain later that you're going to get some, some multiple residential. So we could do that. Thank you. That, that's helpful for my decision. Um, my other question, again, I don't know who could answer this, but I just want to be clear. If, if we don't change the bylaw exemption, then the bylaw exemption remains. And we're not thinking about changing the bylaw exemption. I know bylaw will have to go and 
check, and that might be a nuisance, but it's also a nuisance to make that call over and over again with nothing happening. So the bylaw exemption is pretty solid as it stands right now. Um, I'm sorry, three, Mr. Chairman. The, the bylaw exemption around noise for the kennel. She said she had an exemption. She had to go to all these different spots. Yeah, we're, we're going to check on the zoning to see if the okay. zoning actually has it has it listed as a permitted use as opposed to a legal okay. non-conforming so, use. So maybe maybe a better question, I'm sorry for my misunderstanding, is we've done bylaw noise exem exemptions in the past. Are we able to possibly do one for this piece here so that we aren't annoying bylaw and annoying oh, I see, I see. Um, Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, the, I, think, I think you're referring to a, a, a noise bylaw, something for... Um, an event or something like that. We've dealt with noise bylaws for various weekend mm -hmm. events and festivals and things like that. This is a little different. This is mm -hmm. a land use by in and of its nature creates noise, right? I mean, barking dogs are typical of kennels unless you have dogs that don't bark. Um, so that's that's why, for the most part, they're prohibited throughout the county because we've had no end of compatibility issues with respect to kennels and abutting residential uses. Um, but um, as Councillor Chambers has asked us to do, if we find that this property did actually have a rezoning on it, and part of that will be contacting the owner to find out what records they have, um, I mean, we will certainly do that as well. Um, that might that might help solve that, because the, the Council wouldn't have permitted that use without taking noise into consideration in the first place. My, my last, my very last question. Is there a possible scenario we could find ourselves in where um, if, if the barrier is not going to be acceptable, um, that buffer, enhanced buffer, that we could either drop it down to three lots or move one lot over uh, to the west uh, in order to provide more space between the kennel and the first house. Um, it's difficult to um, answer that only uh, without having that legal nonconformity answered because there's a big, big difference there as Councillor Chambers indicated. If it is truly legal nonconforming, at the end of the day, we want the use to cease. Um, the property is designated residential. It's within the settlement area. They could develop it as well. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Any further comments or questions? If not, I'll call the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion carried. <coughs> this will come to Council in three weeks' time. And hopefully by that time we'll have answers to the questions that Councillor Chambers mentioned. Okay, we're moving on in the agenda to consi consent items. There are no consent items to be approved. There is one consent item to be received, and that is proposed updates to population and employment projections for the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Uh, would somebody make a motion? Councillor Pierce? Councillor Miller, a second? Does anybody have any questions? I do have one question. Yes, Councillor Miller, you go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to staff for bringing this forward. Um, when will we officially know, because um, there was a mention in here, there's a couple questions. One of them is, when will we know that they will want this timeline extended? Because I noticed on here you have it till 2041. And you mentioned in the report that they may be looking at extending that timeline. When, when will we know that an answer to that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillors. So right now we're in negotiations with the province. Those are the two workshops that I attended the last few weeks. Um, I can't say what year that we're going to be projecting to, but they're looking at somewhere between 2046 to 2051. Um, the province, the Ontario Growth Secretariat, is working on this. They've promised that a draft piece of work that will be posted on the uh, EBR will be done in April and it will be finished by July. Okay. Um, one of the big things I guess you're working on, Jennifer, is the Municipal Comprehensive Review. As, and that goes, I guess, with our official plan. And there's a name, and I don't recall, and I'm asking you, because um, there's got to be a financial plan attached to all this as well. What do we call that? Our, our development charges, or our asset management plan, our financial plan, capital plan. Is there a capital plan, or but like to uh, look at how we pay for the uh, the infrastructure and all that? Yeah. So, so basically, part of this forecasting is that a municipality has to has to sustainably plan to the long term. 
So this is not just about building houses, it's about a municipality looking into the future and the fact that growth needs to pay for growth. So it's all part of the development charges, uh, a municipality's financial plan, the asset management plan. So all of this projections and this forecasting is actually to help the municipality pay for things over time so it essentially doesn't go bankrupt. And it's to improve the infrastructure. So these forecasting projections are really just to help the municipality. It's not telling a municipality you have to grow this, these numbers. All municipalities throughout the province in Canada do forecasting to basically look at a financial long-term plan. Um, it just happens to be we're in the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the province has sort of done some number crunching for us. Um, they get tweaked all the time. They get tweaked every five years. We tell them what's working and what's not. There's constant feedback. Um, City of London's redoing theirs right now, City of Ottawa. So they're all doing it. It's not that this is being forced upon us. It's literally to help us to actually project, uh, financially plan, and assure that if there is development, the developers are paying for the actual infrastructure costs to build the homes. So. Okay, so is that what was just a long-term financial plan, I guess? I, th I thought there was a name for that. Uh, well, the county has a financial plan. I believe that it's actually going to be finished shortly, okay. and it's all working in tandem together. Like the financial plan, the development charges are all working together with these, uh, which these forecasting projection numbers. Um, so we do have a financial plan. Um, I can have our CAO speak to when that can be done, if you would like, but I believe it's uh, coming up soon. But it's all tied in together with all the uh, capital assets that the municipality would have. So. Okay. Well, maybe I come up with a fancy name later on. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I gave you a, I threw out a bunch, so you can. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page two of four of your report, under managing growth, um, it states um, settlement areas with delineated belt boundaries and existing or planned municipal services to ensure communi complete communities. And then underneath it says limiting growth in rural settlements and those not serviced. So would an example of that be Scotland? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatward. Yes, so that's an example of, that's taken right out of the, the growth plan itself. So basically what they're saying and what uh, we have to adhere to is that they're trying to say that a municipality should direct growth mostly to their larger settlement areas with infrastructure because it, it comes down to costs, right? Um, and it's saying that, you know, limited growth can happen in smaller rural settlements because there's no servicing. And plus it's more of an impact on adjacent land and it's usually next to agricultural areas. So it's just very limited amount in small rural areas and then the larger growth usually occurs in sort of more urban urban areas with servicing. So if I might, Mr. Chairman, so we, we only allowed four lots a few minutes ago. Um, back a few months, we allowed 22 lots in a community with no services. Where did we draw the line as to limiting growth? So through you, Mr. Chair, so this is part of our whole official plan review is that we actually have to look at all our policies. So these are some of the things that I'll be bringing to the council in the next little while. And these are some of the discussion topics we'll be talking about with the official plan is how much growth we allow and in what places. Um, so these are all policies that we could change in the future. We're writing a new <coughs> official plan. And we've seen obviously some examples tonight about our official plan and the way that it's worked in the past. Things that are good, things that aren't working, but things that can change. So, but we do have the growth plan to conform to uh, by July 2022. And those are some of the directions that we've been given, so. Thank you. Any other questions from council? If not, I have two. Um, one, how will we structure these? form hopefully part of our work on the official plan. I see nothing in your report about the, the title pages. 
you talk about housing supply, but you, you don't go deeper into how much of it will be affordable, how much of it will be multi-density, multi low density. Will that will, will we go onto that point at some point? Yes, to, to Mr. Chair. Yeah, so this report specifically was about the forecasting and, and basically that letter that the province sent um, last month about the way that they're uh, reviewing Schedule 3, which was attached to the report. So Schedule 3 is all based on the forecasting of population. And in the report, I just talked about why we have to do growth management. And one of it is about housing supply. And part of the official plan review is to look at all types of housing and typology. But this specifically was looking at just, my, just about growth management and housing supply. About, But we get into the details below that um, about housing types later. My, so. I think my question is, population there isn't a, a uniform surface I mean we have I suspect we'll have a growing population of older people which ought to uh, influence how we propose our developments going forward uh, that, that, that differentiation within the population of 67,000 the, the measures of that will change so it's, it's a, to me it's an important dimension that we should be thinking about but I'll leave that one with you second question is more I think for the CAO this is very interesting, but to, to just clarify in our new um, committee structure, would this be more in the policy and strategy committee, or would this be in the planning and development uh, committee? And to, 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 through you, Mr. Chair, this report? You well, this, this, gen, this general line of, 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 of uh, issues that we're, we're going to get a series of these coming forward from general plan. Is this, is, is this the forum for it, or would it be the policy and strategy? Yeah, I think our intent would be to shift these to policy and strategy going forward. Thank you. Can I get a uh, mover to accept this? Uh, oh, it's already, oh, we got it. Oh, no, okay, then I'll call the vote. Those in favor? Thank you. Okay. Uh, item 11, advisory committee reports. There is a special agricultural advisory, advisory committee report with minutes. There are two recommendations. Would somebody make a proposal? Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Seconded by Councillor Pierce. Any comments on either of the two items? Bearing in mind we spent quite a lot of time talking about, about the, uh, the first one. Seeing no comments, can I call a vote? Those in favour? Carried. On to staff reports, uh, we have one report and uh, Rob Tucker if you would like to come up and talk about the uh, changes to Planning Act application public meeting processes. Uh, I suggest you talk to it because it probably needs a little bit of uh, colour that we'll add to it. Sure, I can do that Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I'm up here on the assumption that you've read it. It's a fairly brief report but it's it really um, it's really to deal with uh, uh, Bill 108 and the reduced timelines that the province has given the municipal municipalities uh, to deal with uh, zone changes, subdivisions, efficient plan amendments. Um, so to in, on a go forward, uh, what this report recommends is that um, the, there would not be information meetings uh, held in uh, for this committee. Uh, we had one, the very first item we dealt with tonight was, was an example of an information meeting. Um, we had one person who was here, one question that was asked that could easily have been answered in a, in a more informal setting um, at a, an information session that would be held prior to this committee meeting, say at 5.30, 5 o'clock, something like that. Actually, it had to be earlier than that because the information meeting at 6. But um, so th along, that, that's kind of the idea. Uh, so we would, we would have a, uh, an information session prior to the uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting and then another one if needed prior to a committee of adjustment meeting only so that we have two per month so that we can maintain the, uh, the time the time frames that the province has, has given us to deal with applications. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, however, the, the, what you do see in the report is a list of criteria that if an application meets any of those criteria, it goes to that, that information session. Some of them are very, very straightforward and can come straight to uh, the Planning and Development Committee with a recommendation. Um, and we would be doing that for, for the reports that don't meet any of those criteria. So that's, that's the, the recommendation that's in front of you tonight. 
Do you have an example or two of the, the last category? The last category? Um, uh, probably um, well, any, anything on page 235 of my report. Um, any any of the uh, any of the, uh, the bulleted uh, items at the bottom of the page redevelopment or infill projects in existing neighborhoods that would require an information need you, you want you want to get input from the residents on that new subdivisions modifications there too I mean you can go down through and look at the look at the list any of those items uh, would in staff's opinion warrant an information session or perhaps more than one information session if it's if it's a packed house and there's lots of people here with with questions and, and needing of needing <coughs> needing information. Councilor Chambers, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, just just in terms of logistics, if there are three or four, or maybe sometimes uh, five uh, applications requiring information sessions, how do you propose to handle? five information sessions all at the same time prior to a PAC committee meeting. Right. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's, I think it's quite rare that we would have that many. We've had a number of cases where we've had three, maybe four. Um, I think we would obviously extend it and make it a little bit longer. Um, we would have to have uh, uh, different, different segments of the, uh, the chamber broken out for an application over here to, the, to deal with this one, an application over here to deal with that one, or we could time them. We could say at, at a certain time window we, we could deal with this application and at a certain time window deal with the following application. If, if I might just, just add to that, if councillors are supposed to hear information that's available in terms of information sessions, how are councillors going to be in all four corners at the same time to hear all the concerns and information that is being presented. Because part of the reason to have information sessions is to school the councillors on uh, the various applications as well as schooling the staff on applications because the purpose of having an information session prior to the PAC committee where the recommendations are put forward is to allow the public input to have uh, influence on staff recommendations. And theoretically, if there are three, let's say, or even two, and the staff is over here and over here going on at the same time, just prior to a and maybe you can elaborate on what just prior to the PAC committee meeting means. How is that going to influence, which is the purpose of the public hearing, or the public information session, how is that going to influence the uh, planner's recommendation? Um, I, I think there is, uh, it would definitely the, be the most challenging for the councillors. I think for the staff it's not quite as challenging because we would likely have different staff people dealing with different files um, so we can manage that piece. Um, it would be a challenge for councillors to uh, work the room, so to speak, to, to make sure that they are getting information and, and hearing their constituents and, and uh, learning about the applications. Um, we are open to suggestions. The difficulty, of course, is we have been given these short deadlines. We have to do something. And, and if I could, just one final question, if I might. Uh, I, I know in some jurisdictions they don't have information sessions. Correct. Uh, some jurisdictions uh, actually have the public hearing the same night as the council acts on the recommendations from staff. One of the reasons that we went to the system that we do is, again, the, the public needs to feel that what they say at public information sessions or public hearings have an impact or an influence on the staff recommendation. If the staff recommendation is made prior to hearing the public, uh, then we've got problems. And that is why we went from the one public hearing 
where we would have the people come in and the it was preceded by the staff report which had the recommendation to either refuse or or not support and then the people would come in and say well the staff have already made up their mind why am I here having input when the recommendation is already there and that's why we went for the new council that's why we went to this there has to be some mechanism for the public to have influence on the staff recommendation and you're suggesting that it be in the form of an information session which is fine but logistically I think we have got some work to do yeah and through you mr. chairman I don't I don't I don't mean to presuppose that staff would make up their mind before hearing from the public I don't think we I don't think it would be wise to do that I mean there is always an option for a deferral of an item I think that's that's why the report is written written the way it is in terms of here are the criteria that we we pretty much know that this is the type of application that we're going to want input on we will learn as we go there's no question about it but at the same time we are creatures of the province and the province has told us here's your new timeline and so we have to we have to work within those timelines there's a bit of a rock and a hard spot issue here thank you mr. chair I like our current system I really do but this is being imposed on us the timelines I think this is as elegant a solution as you're gonna find I like the criteria that were used and that said it sounds to me as though there'll be two opportunities on generally per month for the public to have some input and maybe actually it might be better input as I find there's a bit of a crowd effect sometimes and there are folks who don't come and speak to staff at these info sessions because they don't want to be filmed and there's not there a microphone in front of the public and all our eyes are on them so there's a positive and negative to that I'm gonna miss the the two cycle sometimes three cycle option we had but that's that's not up to us at this point what I think will also be incumbent on us is and I know we do our homework at this table but we're gonna have to do some of our pre-work and this has been a long-standing issue and I'm as guilty of it as anybody at this table which is saving my questions for the meeting and maybe I need to and all of us need to do more work connecting with staff before meetings and getting clarification or answers and see seeing blind see seeing other counselors on our questions so that we can get some of that clarification and school ourselves a little bit earlier I'm wondering however logistically if we're able to get this info session info before Friday at three you know or if we're able to get it any earlier so that we can do some of that homework as part of the issue is we get a lot of our information packages Friday at three four five six by the time we read it eight nine ten all through the weekend and now we're gonna have a meeting on Tuesday and this meeting will be even earlier on the Tuesday could we move those timelines around so the counselors have more time to to read the packages think of their questions etc through you mr. chairman I think that's something we could certainly look at I think that I mean the the current information meeting that we have is not a statutory meeting at all it's just as counselor chambers indicated it's a it's a it's the first opportunity to really hear from the from the public so there's no timeline under the act that we have to meet to do that so we could get information out to you earlier rather than later on that I think I don't think that there's an issue with that it's more of a coordination issue on our part thank you mr. chairman yeah I when I read this I thought it does defeat what we changed to but and I understand the province wants to speed up and and I'm thinking we talked one time about having a delegation night where anybody could come and speak to counsel I'm not sure if our council meetings with our new structure are going to be really long but council is the last Tuesday of the month could we have a time at the beginning of council where we had information and comments about planning applications and then it wouldn't be until the next week that it actually came to the planning committee 
with a report from staff. Would that work without creating more meetings? We'd be just tacking on some information and any hearing any public concerns about the proposed applications because we're all together. That's just a suggestion that I have that might work. Any thoughts? Um, I just, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I think the only, the only thought is it's, it's a really difficult balance because we, we recognize that council has a lot of evening meetings. You have a lot of commitments. Um, we've, we've tried to uh, create this recommendation so that we're, it's, it's a bit more work for you, but we're trying not to get too, too much more. It's, I mean, you can, I mean, you, we've been here till some nights till midnight almost. So, I mean, we know what it's like for, for all of you. So we're, tr we're trying to balance that. I don't know if you want to be doing that on a council night. Uh, that's why we've split it between the, the uh, on a uh, planning and development committee night and then a committee of adjustment night. At least the room's available. It's open. It's uh, it's available for people. Thank you. Then, then yeah. Just one more quick comment. And when you mentioned five five thirty for a information session, I can't agree with that because I don't think that's convenient for the working public. If somebody works till five o'clock in an office, they can't get here. And I think that if we had information meetings the same night, that they should be at six, start at six, and planning start at seven. I, I just think that gives people, those people that came here from Middleport, they can't make it here in half an hour. It's too far away, so, unless you speed. Thank you. Council Cullen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> I support this recommendation. It, it, we need to streamline this somehow a little bit better. Uh, there's always been confusion in planning because they, they think the recommendation is going to be made that first night, and they, then they get here, and then people realize it's just an information session. So the applicant is flustered. The other people are flustered because they've got to come back again a second time. And this system hasn't worked bad, but it's it's just flustering. And, and, and I think, you know, we look at the last application that we just did tonight, it come here in November, we are now March. That's not right. That's not if I was the applicant, I would be screaming. So I, I think this is, there are is some ways to make this work better. Whilst you're speaking, Council Cullen, I presume you will um, propose this motion. Uh, yeah. And Councilman Miller was about to speak. I'm sure we'll second it. Uh, we can get it on the floor. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, to, through you, Mr. Chair, to, to Rob, um, it, it says, he said uh, notice of an information session would be provided by mail on the county's website with a sign posted on the property. Um, would that be the same little sign that we're using now for... <laughs> Are the big signs now? Same oh, big, big signs. Sign? Okay. Would they be the same big signs that we use for <laughs> notice of um, a, a hearing? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, yes. It's almost the size of that TV screen there. Almost the same colors. So we'll be using the same signs for the information yeah. session as we would for... Yeah, because we just changed the changed the wording on it for the formal public meeting. So. That's the chair. Uh, again, a couple questions. Just logistically... Um, if we have the, the public information session just prior to the public hearing. Not for the same issue, though. Or does it hold through you, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry, I shouldn't cut you off. I'll let you finish. Okay. Let me rephrase my question. <laughs> if, if we are holding an information session just prior to the public hearing, you're suggesting that there's a time lag somehow that staff can receive the information from the information session prior to making a recommendation to the committee. Correct. So that is going to put a lot of onus on the staff to, in terms of a time frame, to consolidate the information in order to make a recommendation uh, at the public hearing. How much time 
do you need to, to do that? Um, if we have, I'm just visualizing the, the, the delegations that were here with regard to the high rise. There may be a, a room full of people. Uh, you're not suggesting that this be held at from 5 to 6 o'clock and then the public hearing be convened at 7 o'clock and dele dealing with the dele it's just not enough time. So I, I'm hearing that there's a, a couple weeks in between yes. the information session and the public hearing. Correct. Okay, so I've got that understood. The other uh, question is with regard to the applicant. Uh, are the applicants expected to be here to answer questions uh, and, and provide information at the information session? And what happens if there is a, a situation where uh, we've had, where, for example, Van Porten is here with two or three different uh, applications. He, I, again, I, I can see confusion at the start. I, I total agreement with Councillor Coleman that we have to streamline the situation, but I'm seeing this might actually make it more cumbersome at the staff level and at the committee level, and I, I think we really have to think this through in terms of logistically how this is all going to happen, because the last thing we want to do is have a whole bunch of people in here and them not getting the information, not being able to provide information, and it could be chaotic. I'm fully trusting of staff that they can make this thing work, uh, and I, I support it, and I recognize that we have to do something, but uh, perhaps uh, there are other simpler mechanisms that uh, uh, could be put in place. Right. I'm going to go to Councillor Pierce and maybe come back to you, Councillor Co uh, Council Chambers, with a a request for an amendment, perhaps? Yeah. I have another amendment yeah. that I want to make yeah. before the vote. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think there's there's some things that we can do to streamline it as well. I agree, but I, I'd be curious to know, it, and I'm, I'm in full confidence that uh, the staff can figure this out. Um, for example, if we were to, to make this information session attached to any other meeting, let alone council meeting, um, I, I can't see how that's going to work in the sense of, like Councillor Chambers says, if we get something in here that's, um, that we get a, a packed room, I, I'm interested how, if the, like the province has put this on, how are other municipalities, um, how have they handled this? Has there been any discussion between to, to understand? Because I don't see how it could, I, I, I don't see how it could work attached to another meeting. I think the information session has got to be something on its own. We may only have one person speak to it. We might not have anybody speak to it, but we may have 30, and we can't stop them from speaking to it. We can't say, oh, sorry, our time is up. We now have to start, have to start this other meeting. So I, I'm curious, has there, what's the dialogue been between other municipalities, or has there been? Uh, no, there hasn't been discussion with other municipalities. Um, what I can tell you is that despite the, the, despite the deadlines that the province gives municipalities, many applications go well beyond those deadlines. Right, right. And it's up to an applicant as to whether they would like to appeal. Um, in most cases, the reason they don't appeal is because, is because they, they have uh, residents who are not supportive. They would like to get as much public support as they can before coming into the, the, the council chamber for the recommendation. Um, they don't like to have packed houses when they, when they bring their, their, their uh, applications back. Um, so they try to work with municipalities as much as they can. We've had um, applications even here at the, in the county that have had a couple of open houses. I think of the Nils trucking site um, on King Edward. We had a couple of open houses on that. Um, none of those were required, but the developer did them be to try and help appease some of the neighbors. Um, and that's well beyond the, the, the now 90 days to deal with that zone change application. Well beyond it. They're in a, an appeal p position today. But for whatever reason, whether it's economics or their timing or their product or whatever, they've chosen not to appeal. There's, there's lots of applications that go that way. They don't all get um, completed within the 90 days. I don't think it's something to fear. I think it's something to be aware of. I think you try to do your best. Uh, I think as long as you're working with people, uh, they, they, tend, they tend not to take it to the LPAT. Okay. Yeah, and as I say, I have full confidence that you guys, the staff will figure this out. But. As Councillor Chambers says, I think it's going to put a, a lot more work on you guys. 
Nikki, it's ten o'clock now. We need to, a motion to go forward. Councillor Coleman has made the motion. Councillor Fagan, all in favour? So back to Councillor Chambers. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to the criteria, I have I'm mystified and dumbfounded by the fact that you placed in there as a, one of the criteria at the request of a councillor. That is pretty dangerous in terms of um, <laughs> a process and logistics as well. Count, the committee has the opportunity as a committee to request an information session if, if, the, um, if, they, if the committee feels that more information is required or uh, uh, for the uh, deliberation of, of the issue. I, I can see that being abused, not necessarily by the people around here, but as we go forward. For example, councillors are not able to call council meetings for good reason, <laughs> because I might call one <laughs> or ask for one. Or it, there's there's a, a, a mechanism and a protocol that it has to be so many councillors with uh, to have a council, special council meeting. I, I can see this being abused, and I, I, I don't think it's necessary, so I, my amendment is to remove at the request of a councillor off the, off the uh, criteria because councillors should make a decision as a committee rather than a councillor with regard to this particular uh, mechanism. So that's my amendment. The amendment is seconded by Councillor Fraser. Any comments on that amendment? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Councillor Chambers is right. Councillors do not call meetings, but the mayor does. And I am wondering if, if there's a controversial issue that doesn't fit somehow in what's listed there, and the mayor gets 10 calls about it, is that not grounds to call an information meeting? because the mayor has the power to call a meeting. Right. Correct, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councilor Chambers is shaking his head there. Would you would like to uh, say the, more? The, the mayor can't call a, a committee meeting, at least not that I've ever known. The mayor can call a special council meeting, but not an information meeting. Members of council, if the mayor doesn't want to call one, we can if there's a, a majority asked at a special meeting, there's, there's a, it's in the procedure bylaw, but the mayor can't call a council me or committee meeting. And currently we call meetings for information and sometimes they're not held here. They're held out in the community, like the subdivision on um, Dundas Street, um, the Poland property. There was two or three meetings about that. Information meetings. I think some of them might have been held here. So, who called those? The developer. The developer. So the developer yeah. can call a meeting, but we can't. Well, I think we're talking about different kinds of meetings. Yeah. I think that, that's composite on the meetings that we. Want to, well, we are trying to seek in, in information and input. The developer has his own reasons for seeking information. Councillor Pugh? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could, for you to Councillor Gatward. Um, as Mr. Trotter stated earlier there, the developer called that meet, called both of those meetings to give further input to the community to try and get the community on side with this development. That was not us. That was the developer as stated by Councillor, or as stated by Mr. Trotter earlier, didn't have to call those meetings, but did in order to um, give his presentation to the community because they were, everybody was against it. Because there'd been an initial public meeting to give information. And if there isn't gonna be an initial 
public meeting on whatever to give information to the public, they're going to get a notice in the mail that says, next week we're having a meeting and we're making a decision. Mr. Chairman, the point of order, it's just what we're walking away from the amendment, which is the issue of a counselor being able to call a meeting. I'm saying this now. That being from the floor, it's been seconded. We've had some commentary. I think I'll call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Those against? So back to the original motion as amended. I think what we have here is a genuinely challenging problem for our planning staff, and we need to work as best we can to help them. So I think this is a very good first step. So if there's no more comment, I will. Okay, comments? Robert, okay. Could I ask for you a question to the general manager? Do you feel that on the basis of this discussion tonight that you would like more time to massage this report? Because I'm prepared to make a tabling motion to allow you to, if that's a request that you might have. Through you, the chair, I'm getting a big yes from the CAO. So, yes, we can absolutely do that and bring it back. So you would like a tabling motion, a big yes? That's pretty dynamic. I'll move that the report be tabled for further staff input to be brought back as expeditiously as possible. Do we need to second the table, motion to table? Do we need to second that? As Councillor Howe did. Any comments? Oh, no, we don't comment on the table motion. Right. I learned that. Thank you. Okay. I wasn't the cue. My only comment would be as we massage that, one of the things to look at would be maybe a six, eight, or ten month, somewhere in there, a review that can come to council with whatever is decided on so that we can review it and tweak it again. A living document. Okay. The motion to table is on the floor. I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Motion carried. Is that clear? Okay. I think we're almost at the end of our agenda. I think I'm almost at the end of my battery. So let me see. Here we are. We have no communications, no other business, no in camera. The next meeting is Tuesday, April the 7th. Note the start time, 6 o'clock. And as I conclude this meeting, thanks to the planning staff. Thanks very much to Amanda, who did a great job there. Pass it all on to somebody else next time. You can take it easy. And I will adjourn the meeting. Oh, no, I need a motion to adjourn. Meeting closed.